Well, good morning, everybody. Could I firstly acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on whose land we meet today, and of course the traditional owners of the lands that various uh, members in this chamber represent, and thank them for their custodianship of country. And that is my traditional beginning for Parliament each day, along with prayers. But I certainly want to say how happy I am to welcome the Australian Institute of International Affairs National Presidents Forum with the theme Australian in the Asian Century here in the Legislative Assembly Chamber this morning. And I hope you enjoy the day in this assembly. It is a very old assembly, of course, the oldest parliament in Australia. And uh, it is a beautiful chamber, as you can see. And I hope you've been able to see some of the beautiful aspects of the New South Wales Parliament on your way in. And if you haven't, please take the opportunity in the breaks to have a look around our parliament. We're very proud of it. And I'm very pleased today to see the themes for your various sessions this morning There will be and, and today. I'm sure there will be some very sensible and intelligent debate unlike what usually occurs in the Legislative Assembly on every day, just about every day. Uh, and I'm certain that you won't become unruly and argumentative and interject and argue with each other, as is the usual norm that happens every day. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the lists of um, the people who are here today, the individual participants, but I do want to say that we do have um, certainly international visitors, senior government officials, senior members of the diplomatic corps, and academic experts, so I'm sure the day is going to be very enjoyable. But I do want to actually name our international visitors and give them a very special welcome. And please, in anticipation of my pronunciation, I will apologise if the pronunciation is not correct. I will do my best. So firstly, to Ambassador Yoshiji Nogami, President of the Japan Institute of International Affairs. Welcome, sir. Mr. Ruan Zonji, Vice President, China Institute of International Studies. Welcome, sir. Associate Professor Simon Tate, Chairman, Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Welcome to you. Uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, His Excellency Biran Nanda, High Commissioner of India. What a beautiful country. I travelled there a couple of years ago and it's a beautiful country, so welcome to you. His Excellency Bold Ravdan, Ambassador of Mongolia. Ah, oh, welcome, there you are. <laughs> to His Excellency Paul Lewin Sain, Ambassador of Myanmar. Welcome to you, sir. His Excellency Abdul Malik Abdullah, High Commissioner of Pakistan. Welcome to you. His Excellency Admiral Multhisara Samar Sinja, High Commissioner of Sri Lanka. Welcome. To Mr. Fonseca Don Santos Pereira, Consul for Timor Leste. Welcome. To Mr. Widya Ramanto, Political Section Embassy of Indonesia. Welcome. Professor Aris Yonaida, Education Attaché, Embassy of Indonesia. Thank you, and welcome to all of um, our other guests, our, our senior government officials, uh, our academic experts. It's certainly going to be an interesting day, having a look at the themes, um, all, all, all under the theme of Australia in the Asian century. Could I in particular also thank Melissa Conley -Tyner, Tyler, who came to me, how long ago was it, Melissa? A couple of months, um, to talk about the work of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, and I have to confess in my ignorance, I didn't know about the Australian Institute of International Affairs. But she was a wonderful advocate for this organisation. And of course, what we all encourage in Australia, and it doesn't happen often enough, is that we have robust debate, that we have knowledge, and when you have debate and you have knowledge, you have a greater understanding and a greater tolerance. And if you have understanding and tolerance, it leads to peace, in my view. So I hope that your discussions this morning will come out with some solid recommendations for government, for them to consider in the future. Uh, obviously, we have to respond to all of the challenges that we face, not only as a state government, but as a federal government as well. So on behalf of the members of the Legislative Assembly and all of the members of the New South Wales Parliament, can I heartily welcome you and warmly welcome you to the New South Wales Legis Legislative Assembly and wish you very well for the rest of your day. Thank you very much. I recall a story uh, from John Landy when he first became Governor of Victoria. John's a sort of very low-key man and a man of huge a personality and integrity. Um, but 
he's not really somebody who's terribly comfortable with honorifics. And when he became governor, uh, his uh, official secretary took him into government house and pointed to a chair like this. John turned round and said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I, I feel a little bit misplaced, although being greatly honoured sitting in this chair, uh, in this great chamber of uh, the first state of the Commonwealth. I'd just like to say again, welcome to those who've come today and thank you, Madam Speaker, for your very kind words. But thank you in particular to those who have come from overseas. Ambassador Nagami, Professor Tay, Professor Ruan. Uh, thank you also to our diplomatic colleagues, uh, representatives of Asian countries who've come today. And thank you, members of the Institute and friends of the Institute for coming today. It seems to me, uh, and I leave the concrete discussion to those that will follow me, but it seems to me we probably have to look at a, a couple of broad areas today. The first is what actually is happening in Asia, and the second is what do we in Australia do about that? And looking at Asia uh, right now, I mean, it, it, it stands to reason we all know that it is in a period of very, very significant change. And this is both economic and as it relates to security. And the two, of course, overlap. It's a terrible mistake to try and divide what is happening in the economic world from what is happening in the security world. They're, they're, they're interchangeable. They're, they're part of the same exercise, in a sense. But it's convenient, perhaps, to, to divide the two for purposes of discussion. But I think uh, it's obvious that for the last 15 years, and it's now well documented, that the fulcrum of economic activity globally has moved from the Atlantic to the Asia Pacific. Um, the question that sometimes arises, is this an irreversible trend or is it something that might falter very seriously? And that perhaps everything that we're doing right now is mistaken. Well, I'm certainly not of that view. I think the change is irreversible, although perhaps nobody wants to forecast cataclysmic possibilities 10 or 15 or 20 years down the line. But all the suggestions are that the trends are irreversible, albeit that there may be some hesitation and faltering and slowdowns in the economic changes that are taking place in Asia. There's already much talk of slowdown in China, and the statistics are beginning to show that. I think we know uh, quite clearly uh, some of the factors at play in India. Over two years ago, just about two years ago, we were looking at something like just under 10% growth in GDP. It's now down to six. Now that all means something. And I think one of the things it means is that uh, India is perhaps approaching a political crossroads where it really has to look very seriously at how its uh, political structures can deal with the necessary reforms that have to take place in India. But having lived there for five years, my strong sense is that the general direction of Indian policy has uh, entered an irreversible phase. I think we also have to look at what happens quite clearly in other countries of the region. I think it's all too easy just to focus on China. Japan remains a very strong country economically. It is actually not doing at all badly economically right now. Uh, and it is going to remain a force to be reckoned with, certainly uh, for two generations. It faces real issues in terms of its demography, but it is a strong, powerful economy and we have to reckon that in to our considerations. And then Indonesia and some of the other countries of the region. But Indonesia again growing at over 6%. Big question perhaps in terms of economic policy 
with the forthcoming presidential elections. But nonetheless, uh, if you spend time in Jakarta, there is a strong sense of momentum in the economy, not necessarily always growing at between 6 and 7 percent, but nonetheless that there is a dynamism there uh, and that that uh, is a dynamism which has not existed in the country since the 90s, the early 90s. Um, so that's the first sort of set of issues. The second is security. And there's been a lot of debate and there's been a lot in the media recently, particularly over, for example, the South China Sea issue. Uh, and there has been a lot of comment on the so-called American pivot last year. A term, by the way, which seems to be diminishing somewhat in the American lexicon. Um, but, you know, we, 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 we quite obviously have to look at a new dynamic, which wasn't there ten years ago. And that is two very, very important powers uh, that have uh, interests in common, but also have some conflicting interests. How is that going to turn out? I'd just like to make two or three very quick points here, I think, and then leave it to others perhaps to develop. Uh, first of all, if one talks about the potential for a real major diminution, major decline in that relationship, it is too easy to forget, and this is something that Professor Ruan mentioned yesterday, the huge, and I, I use that word very, very uh, advisedly, that huge, because it is huge, network of dealings between the United States and China. The committees that are established throughout every aspect of the relationship to deal with each other. And coupled with that, the huge economic relationship. It is all too easy to sort of see the divisions between uh, the United States and China and not see what they have in common. And I think that's very important, particularly uh, when there is often advice given to Australia as to where it might suggest to the Chinese and to the Americans how to deal with each other. Having been on the other end of those sorts of messages for the last 30 or 40 years about where we can affect things in the region, I'm cautious. I'm not negative, but I'm very cautious. And uh, I remain cautious today on these sorts of suggestions. The other point I really want to make about uh, the relationship between the United States and China is it is, and also the relationship between Japan and China, is that it is all too easy to ignore the importance of the economic relationship. And that flows on from my earlier point. If you look at history, uh, let's not go back too far, but just look, let's look at the divide between the West and the Soviet bloc. In those days, the economic relationship or the trading relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union constituted about, in terms of uh, two-way trade, about 1% of United States trade. I think the amount of trade between Japan and the Soviet Union was about 2% of Japanese trade. Um, investment was negligible between the two. If you look at the situation today, China is the United States biggest trading partner with the exception of Canada, and Canada is in a particular case. And I think it is also uh, Japan's biggest trading partner. And then look also at investment. Now these are really, it is really hugely important to see the stake that these countries all have in the other, as well as the stake we have in China uh, and other countries have in China, before one goes too far down the path of doomsday, there are huge reasons to stay uh, in a positive relationship between China, other parts of Asia and the United States. The third point I want to make really here is the importance of multipolarity. I don't want to get down to, uh, into this debate about structures in Asia. I'm naturally a bit cautious about talking about strategic structures. Structures tend to be put in place actually after wars, if you think about it. 
um, there were major structures put in place after the First World War and after the Second World War. You can argue, though I'm a bit cautious on this, that sub-regional structures were put in place after Korea and sub-regional structures, another set of sub-regional structures after Indochina, the three Indochina wars. But I'm cautious on those. But the concept of somehow distributing power in a complicated regional construct seems to me difficult. What you can see, perhaps, is an evolution towards that construct, but it's very, very hard to plan it. Moving from that and asking, you know, what is the best structure for us in the region, I come back to multipolarity. You can talk about balance. People seem to get worried about the term balance. It doesn't worry me too much. I think it's actually quite sensible. But I think it is in Australia's interest, quite obviously, to have a strong economic and positive China playing a positive role in the region. We need the United States in the region for reasons of balance, yes. But, you know, we certainly need them. And I say that unashamedly. Uh, equally, it is in our interest to have a strong India, a strong Indonesia. These seem to me all positive in terms of our regional stability. And so I have no problems at all with talking about a multipolar region. That's perhaps something for discussion further today. What does Australia do about all this? I think there are probably three aspects, broad aspects. The first is what we do internally as a country about the rise of Asia or about the major changes that are taking place in Asia. And uh, the Henry Report is looking particularly at those issues and Peter Drysdale uh, referred to them last night. But we have a long way to go as a country in making ourselves ready. Bear in mind we still have one major asset in dealing with Asia, but we don't have to do necessarily a huge amount of work on this, and this is resources. Never underestimate the importance of resources in our relationship with big countries. It is crucial to our relationship with Japan, crucial to our relationship with China, and crucial to our relationship with India. So, you know, already doing pretty well. We can do far more sophisticated things, we can invest more, all sorts of things. But, you know, that's very, very solid and very, very important. But what do we do internally? And it comes down to a whole host of issues. What we do in terms of our economy, what we do in terms of encouraging business in Asia, what we do in terms of education as a country. Uh, all this very important. Second issue, I think, is that we have to think about, and which is already being debated in Australia, is this rather questionable issue of choice. How do we choose between uh, China and United States, particularly our relationship with the United States? The people who you know, constantly put us in this position of having to choose, I partly blame the rhetoric. I partly blame the rhetoric of uh, some uh, in the political sphere in Australia on both sides that push us or push the public in terms of thinking, thinking like this. I think uh, the United States and China both have a responsibility not to suggest choices necessarily to others in the region. Um, but you know, we should, in terms of our own debate, give ourselves the credit of being able to walk and chew gum at the same time. It is not necessarily a zero-sum game. And a lot of this depends on the skill of our politicians and the skill in our diplomacy. But we shouldn't necessarily uh, find ourselves in the position or suggest that we have to be in the position of choosing between the two. By the way, on this question of the alliance, I should say, uh, and I think most Australians and most thinking Australians are firmly in support of the alliance, it would be very difficult to change it even if we personally uh, disagreed with aspects of it. All the polling shows that Australians are well strongly behind it. Uh, rightly or wrongly, they're strongly behind it. So it's not going to be possible politically, even if one wanted to. But there is a lot to be said for paying our alliance dues only where it is strictly necessary in terms of the alliance. We don't necessarily have to please the Americans, as it's put, on everything. We have to honour the terms of the alliance. What does a responsible ally do? But not necessarily uh, say things or offer them things that really aren't necessary. 
And I think we need to th think through very, very carefully every aspect of that. The third issue when it comes to alliance questions and this question of choice is the question of our political culture and how we present these issues. Time and time again, uh, over 30 or 40 years, and I don't want to blame particular politicians on this, it's the nature of our system as much as anything else. Um, but we have to find better ways sometimes of saying things. Um, one comes back time and time again to the thing John Howard didn't say, which was deputy sheriff. But everybody thinks he said it. In fact, a journalist said it and he didn't deny it. But it stuck. Uh, and presentationally, you know, we are seen very much as an ally, whatever the circumstances of the United States, because of that term. There's another example, uh, and that was, uh, and this is not strictly relating to the United States, there's another question of presentation. Uh, one of our ministers, uh, who was subjected to bad advice by an official on this, after meeting with the Chinese foreign minister, decided that we would very publicly state that we weren't going to be a member, a member of a four-party dialogue involving uh, Japan, the United States and India. In fact, that dialogue at the time had really been weakened. It was really a bureaucrat, a discussion between officials. There was no need for us to take that very public, very open position. But we did. And, uh, you know, the Indians and the Japanese still remind us of it. My point is, it was unnecessary. We didn't have to do it that way. Now, you know, those are just two examples, but there are other examples we can think of. I can think, frankly, something much better if we're going to talk about an agreement by which Marines are stationed in Darwin. It seems to me it's actually not all that important, and I'm not sure it's all that necessary. But the fact of the matter was that the American president in the Australian Parliament made that announcement. Now, perhaps that was very difficult. The Americans wanted to do that to suggest that that might not be the way to do it. But that whole issue could have been handled a lot, lot better. The Chinese and the Indonesians could have been forewarned very seriously two or three days before and explained very, very carefully at a very senior level about what it all meant. None of that was done. So there was a huge fanfare. It looked great. Uh, there were great uh, political takeaways for both leaders. Uh, but where does it leave us? With a, with a few problems, I would suggest to you. And I think the third area about, you know, which is important to Australia is how do we deal with Asia? And here, really, uh, it is a question of, you know, listening to what Ken Henry says, and I don't know entirely what this report is going to say yet, but all the messages I'm hearing is, yeah, it's going to be a good report, it's going to be a thoughtful report, but by Jesus, there isn't going to be any money. Well, you know, give us a break. Do we, are we really serious? about what we're doing in Asia. If we're really serious, you need to concentrate and put resources into certain areas. The first thing you do is to put money into a seriously depleted foreign service. Could be a great foreign service. There are very good people in it. Uh, but, you know, it is being whittled away. And it is being whittled away at the expense of big increases in the intelligence services, great huge increases in giving development assistance away, but a decrease in your capacity to persuade. Not very smart. Not very smart. The third area is what we are doing in terms of telling Asians what this country is really about. I call it public diplomacy. Not everybody is in favour of public diplomacy. But it is getting through to Asian publics about what makes this country tick. You do it in several ways. You do it by messaging going out, whether it be broadcasting or other, other messages, other systems. You do it above all by bringing people to Australia, be it scholarships, visitor programs. You do it by sending Australians out. And the opposition has come up with a, a very good proposal which has the effect actually of expanding something that's already been done. It's not entirely new. Uh, but it's a good suggestion, much more in terms of sending Australians overseas. Uh, sometimes some call it outward scholarships. I'm not sure that's quite the term, but that's essentially what it's about. But we have to do a lot more about explaining about the sort of country we are. 
Bear in mind, this is essentially, while multicultural, a Western country which is on the cusp of a whole group of countries with totally different backgrounds and cultures, totally different religions. And this is our foreign policy priority area. This puts us in an entirely different position, for example, to similar sorts of countries like Canada. Canada is multicultural too. Canada has very similar systems. But their primary foreign policy focus is on the United States first, secondly on Europe, and then thirdly uh, on perhaps Asia and Latin America. It's just different to us. We, we can't afford the luxury of being uh, inward looking. We have to look out to Asia. We have to put systems in place which enable Asians to understand us better. The, the, the burden is on us. But on this issue of foreign policy and foreign service and our capacity to persuade, uh, really we have to recover from two decades of bipartisan neglect. And really that is crucial. That is one of the tests. This is going to be one of the tests of whether this government means what it says about Asia. Okay, that's enough, the bell rang. Thanks. Right, without further ado, let's uh, get into the game. Melissa did say when she told me I had to sit up here that it does look uh, rather gigantic and rather ridiculous. I've never been accused of being gigantic, but as a long-term servant of the state, being ridiculous is something I've, I've done uh, whenever necessary, which has been quite often. Uh, I'd also like to thank John very much for his terrific remarks, which saves me all the trouble of saying any of the other things I was going to say, uh, because uh, he has done it so very, very well. The, the only observation I would make that is that for many Australians in this room, uh, we've, we're well into our Asian century. I mean, when I turned up as the lowest form of animal life in the Australian Embassy in Tokyo back in the 1970s, several years prior to that, Japan had replaced the United Kingdom in terms of overall economic importance to Australia. And really, ever since then, we in Australia have been in our Asian century. Now, I know the term is acquiring a different, a different meaning now with the rise of the various Asian powers, but I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that. And many of the Australians in this room have given most of their professional lives, if not all their professional lives, to working out how we best uh, handle and manage, manage this in our interests and in the interests of our neighbours. And I think we need to bear that in mind. It is the core issue. This is why we're having the white paper produced. It's why we're discussing it today. And it's why the entire day is devoted to Asia, Australia and the Asian century, but this first session is devoted very specifically to looking at the, the question in total. I'd just like to thank all our foreign visitors who are coming here today for helping us to think about this question, which is really crucial for us, but we, can only, we can't do it on our own. We have to do it in partnership. Uh, with, with the other people with whom we share the region. So without any further ado, I would like to turn over to uh, Professor Simon Tay, who's the uh, Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, to make his remarks. Good morning, Madam Speaker, Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to give some remarks. Uh, I was asked to be a trigger speaker and to keep it brief. I'm not sure whether there's much to be said after John's uh, very insightful opening uh, commentary, but allow me to try. Uh, in so doing, while I am from Singapore, allow me to try to aggregate some of the views we have from ASEAN. I head the Singapore Institute, but we are partners with the ASEAN uh, think tank network, ASEAN ISIS. Uh, it, by the way, it gives me great pleasure to be back in the Parliament House, having served in Singapore's Parliament. So in the spirit of brevity, allow me to sketch some uh, broad strokes. I tend to write commentaries uh, in the newspapers of the region, so I won't run through all the detail, and certainly we've had some very interesting times. I would say that the first broad stroke I would say is that we are dealing with some, I think, quite fundamental changes uh, here in Asia regarding the shift of power. Uh, the horizontal idea of the shift of power between countries is clearly one dimension. But equally, I think there is a question about the vertical axis in terms of 
while we have not had an Arab Spring, we are seeing in many ways the diffusion of power uh, across many of our societies. And it's creating a much more difficult way for governments to direct uh, power. In fact, I will also say that the very question of power, uh, the nature of power, is shifting. In many ways, when we talk about Asia's rise or China's rise, we are kind of making an assumption about power, that economic rise, which seems here, if not just inevitable about here, uh, translates to political and security power. And then from there, it will translate somehow to a kind of normative power as to what we would like to, uh, uh, to follow or what we'd like to uh, uh, emulate. And I think there are these question marks in a very sort of deeper philosophical way. So in this sense, the first broad stroke, I would say, is that when we look at different phenomena in the newspapers, whether it is the South China Sea or the rocks in northeast uh, part of the region, like a bamboo, we are seeing this above the surface. But there are some deeper changes, like a bamboo again, the rhizome, the, the, the whole thing below the surface is changing. So we should expect different stalks, different shoots coming up, but try to understand the deeper one. And in that sense, I'm very glad that to be here in Australia when you are thinking through this, because clearly Australia is not alone in dealing with this issue. Among Asians themselves, we are thinking about how to deal with the so-called Asian century. Because this comes to my other point, that really it is probably too early to talk about an Asia. Uh, in many of the phenomena we see, there is not just a historical difference, but a present and ongoing contestation of who it will be that will be, in a way, the hub, the, the, the power makers or the, the, the policy makers in Asia. So given these shifts and uncertainties, uh, broad but also deep, as well as the surface, you know, the global financial crisis, the problems we see in Europe, which are trickling down into the Chinese system. Uh, India has its own issues, but also affected in terms of exports. I think there are a lot of reasons that given this period of uncertainty and change, one should not make a choice. Uh, to me, the other broad analogy I'd have is like, it's as simple as buying some new bit of technology, let's say a phone. You know? I guess right now, the phone of choice for most people is the iPhone. But when we read about the new, cheaper Chinese phones, and we realize more fundamentally that the iPhone is manufactured, though not designed, in China, perhaps we want to put off such purchase decisions. Because you know, uh, uh, once you plunk your money down, it's hard to come back to make a change. So I stand for the idea that none of us should be rapidly making a choice. Uh, of course, we are, in a sense, active. And this is the difference between a sort of a one-off choice, like a purchase, rather than an ongoing relationship choice. Uh, to put it another way, I think those of us who are wedded to an alliance deeply one way or the other will have to probably, without abandoning the alliances, to shift, to be more careful what it means to be an ally while being true to your own national interests and the broader interests. In other words, rather than a kind of uh, a, a monogamous alliance where one is always by the other side, we have to start thinking in a multilateral way about a more adroit, flexible, and choice at point to point about different ways of constructing our relationships. Uh, and in this sense, a, a kind of nimble policy choices, I think, are going to face us much more than a one-off, I'm always with you choice. And I think that this applies to ASEAN as much to anybody else. ASEAN has going to face a lot of the problems. Uh, it is because ASEAN has, in default, become the hub of whatever Asia that is arising. I, I know that uh, Australia certainly has a voice there, but Australia is one country, perhaps ASEAN as 10, those small and medium sized, has tried to come together in ways that minimize differences, create some norms, and therefore attract others to ASEAN. When I say that it is a hub, I don't mean we've deserved it, it's more of a default. And right now, this default hub is under tremendous pressures as, despite their deep interdependence, China and America, or some elements in China and America, seem to be stirring things up between themselves. 
And similarly, amongst Asians too, some elements in, say, Japan and China are also stirring things up. We are, in a sense, trying to fight about what vision of Asia we have for the future. Having come from Singapore, I should quickly distance myself from another Singaporean, Kishon Mbani, a friend, but distance in terms of our views. He sees Asia's rise as irresistible, and in that term, he sees Asia as one. I, myself, think Asia's rise is much more contingent, that America can't be written out of the frame, and therefore I stand for a much more idea of uh, open uh, but universal Asia, not unified but still open in outlook, rather than a sort of Asian bloc, which sometimes people at Kisho tend towards talking about. So, if I may close, because I heard the bell, is that the final bell or the first bell? So I have one more minute. Yes. In my one minute, I would say that Australia does face a choice. Uh, as I said, and caution the, not a kind of once and for all choice like buying an uh, iPhone. Well, it's not once and for all, it's once in about two years you change your phone. <laughs> but I think you have a real choice between the alliance only emphasis or the kind of flexible choice uh, uh, policy. The second thing is that you have a choice between trying to work alone. Australia is kind of big enough to think it could work alone. My country, Singapore, isn't. And ASEAN, though economically about the same size as Australia, I think it's clearly an effort not to work alone. I think the choice for Australia sometimes is to either think you can work alone in this dynamic Asia-Pacific or raft together with other smaller and medium-sized countries to find some common positions and exchange some notes about what to do about some very fundamentals in countries much bigger than certainly Singapore and also Australia. And the third choice, I think, in engaging Asia is between the outward Asia and the inward Asia. I would say Australia, when I sit in Singapore, is remarkably outward Asia. You know, I can go to various restaurants in Singapore and find myself surrounded by Australians, for better or worse. Uh, probably for better. The food choices have improved, thanks to you. But I would say you do face a choice of the inward Asia. A question of whether it is reluctant, whether it is uh, question marked, I think that is a perception that still persists amongst Asians about uh, Australia's openness to Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tay. Uh, that's an uh, excellent start. Now I'd like to turn over to my good friend, uh, Dr. Linda Jacobson, who's uh, director of the um, East Asian program at uh, the Lowy Institute for International Policy. Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to the Australian Institute of International Affairs for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure and an honour. When I moved here to Australia from China, where I had lived for 20 years, about 16 months ago, I was very struck by the fact that there was very little debate on China. After all, Australia's most important trading partner, but also importantly, the country which in less than a decade has risen to the position of being a strategic competitor of Australia's alliance partner. Elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific region, especially in Southeast Asia, right next door, elites have already for several years debated, mulled over, argued about this predicament of being so dependent on China for economic prosperity, but also at the same time not wanting to antagonize the United States, which after all has been the guarantor of security in this region for the past six decades. But I didn't see evidence of this kind of a debate in Australia. Now of course in the course of the last 16 months this has changed. Finally, today Australia's relations with China are a focus of discussion here in Australia. I think um, to start off with, John McCarthy has already very eloquently described the key features. I agree with our panel chair that didn't leave so much more for us others to put in. I think the reasons for the debate finally starting are plentiful, of course, the government's decision to commission the white paper on Australia in the Asian century is one of them. But most of all, I think the debate 
on Australia-China ties um, within Australia um, was spurred to life by President Obama's visit last November and the announcement of strengthened defence cooperation between Australia and the United States. Um, of course, the media, both here in Australia and also um, abroad, have paid a lot of attention to the basing of the 2,500 Marines for a part of the year in Darwin. Um, but de facto, there were many other aspects of defence cooperation which were agreed upon. Slowly and then in drabs, we had former Prime Ministers, Malcolm Fraser, Paul Keating, former Coalition Leader Malcolm Turnbull, former Secretary of Foreign Affairs Richard Wolcott, who is with us here today, a handful of former very senior um, ADF officers, um, coming out to question A, how the Gillard government had handled the Obama visit, and then more broadly, the question of Australia-China ties. Was it appropriate, among others, was asked, was it in Australia's national interest to allow the US President to de deliver a speech criticizing China in Australian Parliament? Um, most importantly, the central theme in all of these commentaries has been that is it in Australia's national interest to be perceived by Beijing as simply following the policies of the United States which, of course, are crafted with the US national interests in mind. I find it very interesting that most of those who have spoken out um, are already so-called in retirement age. They were the ones who crafted policies a few decades ago, but now they are the ones who are telling us that we do need a rethink. Um, Australia should not get too, quote, unquote, stuck in thinking of policies that were crafted decades ago. Um, I came across an interesting um, statistic. When Howard took power in 1996, five, under 5% 5 of China's, Australia's trade with China, um, um, Australia's trade with China made up only 5% of Australia's overall um, exports. And of course, today we all know that it's over a quarter. Um, so we're living really in a different era and we need to rethink um, the challenges of this era. My small contribution to this emerging debate on Australia-China um, has so far been a Lowy Institute policy brief about the need to build political trust between Canberra and Beijing. Now, Australia's political relationship with China is far less developed and its economic relationship. Uh, the countries do not have a regular, high-level strategic dialogue, which would really enable senior political leaders of both countries to regularly interact, better understand their counterparts' thinking, and routinely discuss many different kinds of areas of disagreement. Moreover, um, Chinese and Australian senior leaders only discuss regional issues bilaterally when senior leaders happen to meet overseas. And consequently, I think Australia risks being viewed by China's top policymakers merely as a provider of resources. And since the Darwin decision, perhaps merely as a mirror medium of the United States. I think it would be in Australia's interests for the Prime Minister to clearly state Canberra's desire to build substantial political ties with Beijing and with the specific goal of increasing political trust. Um, I also think Australia should pursue an annual high-level strategic and economic dialogue with China. And this dialogue should be sought at a very minimal at the cabinet minister level and include all three strands, the political, the defense, and the economic. I think this would at least help to increase clarity about each side's intentions, and it would compel officials at all levels uh, to improve communication across multiple departments. Um, I also think that Australian leaders should strive toward building political trust with their Chinese counterparts by avoiding empty rhetoric. Um, I, I for example, in the policy brief, say that time and again we hear that the pivot 
um, we hear from Australian political leaders that the US pivot to Asia is not about China. Well, it is about China, and of course the Chinese know it too. Um, China's rise causes concern, it causes anxiety, it even causes fear because of all the uncertainty it entails. No one knows for sure, not even the Chinese themselves, and in private conversations they're the first to admit it, what kind of a power China is going to involve into. So these concerns and these anxieties need to be discussed more thoroughly, um, both in public but also behind closed doors between the senior leaders of the two countries. Um, of course, this policy brief only focuses on the Australia-China relationship, um, but certainly acknowledges um, that a lot has to also be done between Australia and other key partners in the region. Um, to conclude, and I have been asked to be brief, I advocate that the Australian government explains clearly to the Chinese political leadership what it stands for. Um, Australia's alliance with the United States is a permanent arrangement. I don't think anyone who has spoken out about Australia ties and been critical of the Gillard government in any way questions that the alliance is the bedrock of Australian security. Um, but, and then I'd like to paraphrase something that Richard Wilcott wrote, an alliance is not synonymous with compliance. And being a friend, being a friend of China does not entail agreeing on just about every issue. On the contrary, there are many things that China and Australia disagree about. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Linda. Um, uh, and I've been told that uh, we're allowed to go on until um, 10 40. We'll need to bring it to a close then. So I'd now like to open up the discussion, but first of all, if I can try in my own way to briefly encapsulate the points that I took from our two introductory speeches. Um, one of the points made by Professor Tay was that there are fundamental changes underway, and there are shifts of power, both horizontal and vertical. Now, many people here will be aware of uh, Hugh White's quarterly essay, um, uh, 18 months or so ago now, called Power Shift, and his more, more recent book. Uh, Hugh was talking about one sort of power, um, and I think it was a useful reminder that uh, power exists in more than one dimension, and the sort of power shifts going on within Asia, as well as between certain Asian countries uh, in, in terms of their relative strengths vis-a-vis -vis the United States. These things need to be considered uh, together. Uh, then, as they also pointed out, it's still too early to speak of Asia as a single unit. Uh, there are uncertainties about uh, how Asia works together. It tells, tells us very wisely, I think, we need to nuance our, our choices, even if we end up trying to, having to sometimes be forced to make binary choices, that we should at least nuance them, not be oversimplistic. They need to be adroit and nimble, which is, of course, is easier said than, said than done, but we should bear it in mind all, all the same. And again, I mentioned uh, Hugh White. Hugh actually does say, uh, a, a lot of what uh, he's been interpreted as saying is we need to make a, a choice, we need to change the way we do our choices. What he's arguing, and he repeated this again at the launch of his book in the Parliament House yesterday by uh, Malcolm Turnbull, that if we in Australia ever actually find ourselves in the position where we have all we can do is to choose between China and or the United you know, States, so we have actually failed. What we have to be doing, you don't have to agree with Hugh's policy prescriptions for this, but what we have to be doing is to work out how we can avoid being put in this position uh, of having to say either one or the or the other. And in this, we are not alone. This is the other point that I drew from Professor Tay that uh, you know. Uh, the countries of ASEAN too have to make their choices. Everybody is everybody is making choices, um, and he pointed out the fact you know, even within Singapore there's vigorous debate. The, the, the views he's advanced and the views being advanced by Kishore Mahbubani. Uh, it's all the more reason, therefore, why we in Australia should also engage in the debates taking place in the various uh, countries of Asia. Turn to Linda. Uh, Linda concentrated on Australia-China, and Australia-China is certainly very much at the heart of. 
uh, much of the current thinking, the most pointed thinking that we are engaging in in, Aus in Australia, we also need to bear in mind that this also does have to be placed in a broader Asian, Asian context. Um, she suggested we may be stuck in some ways with the policies of, of earlier decades and our thinking is not keeping up with the rapid and, and dynamic change and I think this is certainly something we, we, we need to think through carefully. She asked, how are we perceived by, by China? And out of that, how, not only how are we perceived by China, but how are we perceived by other major countries in, in, in the region. Of course, we think about how we're perceived by, by the United States as well. The, the, the issue here, I think, is we're, we are often not sufficiently careful in the way we send signals. And John has touched it, so I don't want to, want, want to repeat this. We have some good examples of policies which might be quite OK per se, but in the way in which they've been articulated, or failed to be articulated, uh, we've done ourselves uh, and do ourselves a disservice. And again, the final point that uh, Linda made, again, on the alliance, and this is going to keep on coming back because in the discussion we have in Australia, Australia in the Asian century, Australia in Asia, the alliance with the United States is always going, going to be there. But the question is, again, not do we have the alliance or don't we have the alliance, but how do we interpret the alliance? And again, how do we convey to others why we have the alliance, and most of all, how do we perhaps convey to ourselves and discuss more clearly, articulate more clearly to ourselves, what we are in the alliance for? Where is our national interest? I think we understand quite clearly where the US national interest is in, in, in ANZUS. We need to articulate again and keep on revisiting precisely where our national interest lies here. I think they're the points that I took from those two excellent opening presentations, so I'd now like to open up um, to discussion, but I would stress discussion. Uh, while people may well have uh, questions they wish to address to either of the speakers, and they're perfectly at liberty to do so, the, the main point, as I understand it, of, of this and subsequent sessions is not actually to interrogate the introductory speeches, but to engage in a, in, in a discussion uh, in which we are all involved. Uh, and that being the case, I'll try to deal with uh, deal with is inappropriate. I shall try to respond to uh, uh, people who express an interest in speaking uh, pretty much in the order in which uh, you express your interest, but I will also try to follow, follow particular strands of discussion. Uh, and we now have, yes, just on half an hour in which to do that. So who would like to kick off? Gary. Thank you very much um, uh, for having me here today. Um, in regard to Professor Simon Tay's um, uh, uh, admirable um, uh, discourse, I too am troubled by the fact that we still use the word Asia so um, lightly and um, unthinkingly. But there's nothing that immediately comes to mind to replace it. Uh, nations of Asia, countries of Asia, doesn't sound quite right anymore in this globalised world. I wonder whether we can't slip into a um, terminology which better reflects the um, uh, great changes that have taken place in my lifetime in Asia. Maybe members of the Asian community or some such phrase as that. This terminology can be important, I think. We need to apply ourselves to, uh, to it and to avoiding using uh, Western inventions and outdated terminology. Uh, in regard to China, um, there has been a slippage. Um, I don't want to sound nostalgic, but um, uh, 1979, China said that they wanted to make um, uh, high-level visits to Australia regularly. They would reciprocate every visit made by Australia. In uh, 1986, we established a Joint Ministerial Economic Cooperation Committee, which included the Foreign Minister in his own right, because there was no Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade at that stage. We sent six ministers to China for um, uh, discussions with their counterparts on what was to be an annual basis. We did have the uh, dynamism at that stage to create just the sort of um, uh, uh, processes for a regular consultation that um, uh, Dr. Jacobson says quite rightly are vitally necessary. Thank you, Karen. If I might just, while people are thinking of, of other things to come in on, I'd like to add to what Gary said. 
uh, and that was very true about the dynamism of the relationship we had. Of course, it actually came to an end in 1989 as a result of circumstances uh, over which we had no control. Then things changed and China came back uh, more powerfully than ever, at which time more and more other countries became involved and uh, we, were, we were one of a much larger pack, uh, which is no reason why we shouldn't be bending all, all our efforts to doing more. And I think it's, it's a good thing that we finally decided to open up another consulate in, uh, in Chengdu, but uh, for quite a long time our diplomatic representation uh, was, was better than pretty much any other Western country in China, and it's not been the case for quite some time, and that reflects the overall uh, downturn in spending and attention given to the Department of Foreign Affairs, which again, uh, John made uh, in a very correct and pointed fashion. Uh, Richard Bronowski, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here last night. I obviously missed some interesting uh, conversations then. To take up a point Gary made, we used to have in the 70s, early 70s, uh, a mechanism in Canberra for coordinating uh, Australia's relations towards Japan. And um, we had three committees with businessmen and state uh, interests and, and, uh, and the Commonwealth Public Service. We had a committee that wasn't allowed to delegate. Uh, permanent heads have to be there and not, their, not those they delegate. So John Stone was particularly angry about this committee, but we had it. That worked towards Japan. It occurs to me that we've read, never really done a similar exercise towards China. And I, I put it to you that it's a possible idea that could be modified and used towards our evolving relationship towards China, which is about the same stage now that our relationship with Japan was in the 60s and the 70s. One thing we're very concerned about, and this came out in the Maya report that was the, the the bench for the development of this committee was that Chinese, that the, the Japanese were trading off one interest in Australia against another, one commercial interest against another, one state against another. And the philosophy was we really should get together and get our act together. Secondly, if I could just question Professor Tay about his intriguing view that there is a, I think I've got this right, Professor, that there is a, an inward and an outward manifestation of Australian thinking towards Asia. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more particularly about what you mean by the inward dynamics of thinking in Australia. Thank you. Professor Tay, would you like to respond to that? I should say, well, thank you for the comment, Mr. Kronowski. I think first, just to articulate a bit more about inward Asia. Um, I think that all countries that wish to be influential need also to think about themselves being influenced. Um, unless you really regard yourself as the sort of uh, beacon on the top of the hill uh, to cast light upon everyone. So in the sense of about an inward Asia, I guess it will be a big challenge for Australia in the sense that, as John and others have remarked, your systems are quite different. Uh, we, we share that a bit too. I mean, our systems in Singapore are quite different from our fellow Asians anti-corruption, rule of law, uh, maybe not so much on democracy, uh, but um, other aspects where we have to, uh, in a way, without putting aside what makes us Singaporeans, uh, also learn to deal with the region as they are and not wish they were ourselves. So I think that's what I mean a bit by Inward Asia. Additionally, uh, secondly, uh, the perception issue. Um, again, it's about managing signals. I didn't want to get into the minute, but you know, the Huawei uh, announcement on the back of the Darwin announcement. Uh, and, you know, from Singapore's point of view, uh, the SGX uh, uh, rejection by Sydney, uh, really, they just culminate. Uh, of course, you can point to a lot of success for Singapore has, for example, I think Singapore Company is part of a power plant right here, uh, or somewhere in Australia. So, so the realities are maybe quite different, but the perceptions, I think, uh, are very much that when you look at your Asia policy, it's very much your sales or your services and other things into Asia, and not so much to do with the other. Thank you for that. Thank you very much.
very much. Um, I'm a, my background is 34 years in the Australian Foreign Service, and um, uh, one's thought all one's life about the top-level political and security exchanges between our leaders and how we build those. Um, since standing back from that, I've become much more aware and sensitive to the really significant and important importance of links at other levels in our communities. Um, I've become more aware of the really deep significance of relations between our universities, between organisations like the Institute of International Affairs and our sister organisations in the region, uh, about connections between community groups and the huge scope for development of relationships between our country and those in our region through those sort of contacts. And in the end, it's those sort of contacts which build the deep and en enduring links which enable our countries to survive and get over uh, incidental political hiccups uh, um, which uh, arise from maybe unfortunate turns of phrase at one time or another. And so I'd very much like the government in, in uh, coming up with this review now of Australia in, the, in Asia uh, to focus very largely on those links as much as the uh, top level political and security links, important though those are. I don't want to, uh, to, to denigrate their importance, but I do think that if we're serious about being part of this region and of allowing this region to really influence us in a way which will be beneficial to us as a society and as a country, I think we need to give much greater concern and much, uh, much higher level of resources to those levels of engagement. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Miller. Uh, if I'm correct, I think there's a quite a, a, a widely expressed theme both last night and today that in conducting its foreign policy towards Asia as towards other countries, uh, we should uh, clearly be independent in what we do and take in, make independent choices and not simply uh, follow uh, behind the uh, decisions taken by our great alliance partner. I must say that, uh, like Sue, having spent a long time in the Australian Foreign Service, I always thought we really did seek to take independent decisions. But clearly there's now concern about some developments to do with the Alliance and particularly in the military sphere and in particular these have been uh, focused on the uh, posting of the US Marines in Darwin. But at the same time I think uh, if we're looking at the US-China relationship we have to be conscious of many other expressions on the US side of what that consists of. And I think of, a, of an excellent speech which Hillary Clinton made in uh, New York, I think, some months ago. And uh, even just this morning, the remarks reported in the Sydney Morning Herald by Kurt Campbell, in which he clearly emphasised something that's been emphasised today, that uh, the US and China have a very intense and uh, very highly networked relationship. So I think really what we're expressing this concern about, or what the concern is being expressed about, is some tendencies by some groups in the United States, and also, of course, uh, I think they have a reflection in China. So if I can borrow a word from Professor Tay, I think it's a nuanced concern that's being expressed. Thanks. I wonder if I could come back and, uh, and ask uh, Gary to um, just spell out a little bit more his, um, his, his point about what we mean by Asia. It is an issue, I mean, it, 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 in terms of my own experience for quite a long time when we in Australia spoke about Asia, we generally meant, uh, when we were talking trade and economics, obviously we went North, Northeast Asia. Uh, in, in other areas we, we would talk about Southeast Asia and talk about ASEAN. In more recent years, uh, we have come more automatically to include India in the subcontinent, particularly India anyway, in our discussion of, of, of Asia and when we think about uh, architecture and both strategic and economic futures and these sorts of things. Uh, but of course other people will, will, will have quite a different idea of what Asia is all, all together. I mean I was surprised to find when I was serving in Israel that um, many people regarded that as part of Asia or at least said that the minute you crossed the um, 
they crossed the, 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 the Jordan, in other words, crossed the Rift Valley, you were geologically in Asia, and Asia is Asia, and that the Greeks certainly thought it was Asia, and who's to gain say the Greeks? Um, uh, I think our own our own concept of of Asia is one which is which is uh, dynamic and changing, and probably the most striking aspect of that is the way in which I think increasingly including India uh, in our default thinking about Asia is, is 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 part of what we're doing. But I'd be interested, Gary, if you had any further thoughts on that, or anybody else for that matter. Uh, Richard, you're putting me on the spot for an old man who starts to talk about um, uh, memories that are very dim. When I first um, uh, began thinking about Asia, it was only China and India. And uh, for me, India was um, uh, Gandhi, Nehru, Panikkar's um, uh, a book, um, uh, The Rise of Asia and the End of Western Dominance, I think, 1952 or 53. And that was a book that um, was vigorously debated within the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs at that time. Um, but um, uh, uh, on, the, on the Chinese side, we were probably a little out of date. Lin Yutang and the wisdom of China, those sorts of things, uh, probably seen China through um, a rather old-fashioned uh, context. Uh, and because we did not honor our promise to the British to um, join them in recognizing the People's Republic of China in 1949. We quickly um, uh, moved away from getting an understanding of China as it really was into a very narrow, distorted, and um, uh, uh, in many ways demonized view of the country. Now, of course, um, uh, Asia is, um, uh, well, what my young men used to say, Asia is a smorgasbord. Asia is vitality everywhere. Um, and um, uh, every country developing uh, in its own way and with its own characteristics. And that's what makes it exciting. And that's why I want to think of Asia as something unique, but which has national characteristics. Um, uh, and um, uh, you and I were talking just before we came in about the vitality of Vietnam. The, uh, the future of Asia uh, is for everybody uh, in Asia, including Australia to sort out. We don't know how it's going to work out, but we do know that it's a dynamic and exciting thing and that there is a sense of community in it. Now, pinching a bit from uh, the Singaporean expression about communitarianism and suggesting we talk about members of the nation community, I do think we um, uh, are, uh, in our own dynamic and active ways, all working towards something we cannot yet clearly foresee. Thanks very much, uh, Gary, and you'll be uh, happy to know that um, Lin Yu Tang is having a major revival in China and has been over the last decade, so you're, you're not anything out of the place, as you thought. Yes. Um, but also that ties in quite where your, your, your concept of the, uh, the varieties of Asia, if you like, does chime in well with what Professor Tay said. Now, somebody else who's thought a great deal about Asia and Australia and Asia is Alison Bronowski. Alison, you had an observation to make. Thank you, Richard. I, this gives me an opportunity, actually, to take something out of my presentation this afternoon. Sorry, do you want to stand up and use one of those microphones so everybody can hear you? Right. Yeah. This actually gives me an opportunity to save some time from my presentation this afternoon by talking about this Asia question. And I'm not going into the insides of Asia, which Gary has, has referred to eloquently already, um, although I'd like to say that those were the days when there was vigorous debate in DFAT about a book. Not anymore. I don't think anybody reads them. Perhaps they haven't time. Um, but I think that when the Prime Minister commissioned Dr. Henry to write a white paper on the Asia century, she must have known what she was doing. And in calling it the Asia century, I take it that she meant not the Asia Pacific century. And it's very important for people, and I notice that people sometimes perhaps unconsciously exchange one for the other, but in the discourse within government and within the region, the difference between the two is very clearly understood. 
And I do hope that in the debate that will follow the, Ken, the release of Ken Henry's report, that, and, and indeed in the report itself, that this is made clear because what is understood, and don't let's forget, it's not for us to say what Asia is, it's for the region and people who live in it, as they have been doing for more than 100 years, to define this in their own way and for us to accept that. And if we wish to be part of it, we need to be cognizant of our position as not defining it but theirs. That Asia means the countries of Asia. Asia-Pacific means the countries of Asia plus the United States and whomever else is attached from the other side of that ocean. And there's a very significant difference here. And when the Prime Minister called for this white paper, I thought, hooray, at last. We are going to have a discussion about Australia's role in a region that is of great importance to us, but in which we will be discussing our role, not our role so much as a US ally. Because the minute the United States gets involved in this, the whole thing becomes strategic, it becomes about defence, it becomes about major power rivalry, and that is of no interest for us in what we are seeking, to, what I understand we're seeking to do in this white paper. That is, carve out an acceptable place for ourselves in an evolving, developing, very promising region that is not constricted by our alliance with the United States. So in our deliberations here, and I hope when the Henry Report emerges, we can keep that distinction clearly in mind. I hope we are talking about Asia. I hope we're not talking about Asia Pacific. Well, that's uh, a really important uh, point that you make. And I noticed the Americans in most recent articulations are constantly talking about Asia Pacific, quite possibly for the reasons that you give. Um, press start with you, Rick. I should stand up, I suppose. Thanks, uh, Richard, and uh, thanks again for having me. Just four little points, if I may, in response to things people have said. Uh, Asia, yes, uh, needs lots of definition, but however we define it, for the sake of our interests, could we please exclude West Asia, a nightmare between Bombay and Beirut for as far ahead as we can see. Um, I think uh, a second point to make, uh, Richard, is that uh, there was, in the late 80s and 90s, a deputy secretary level committee on China. In, it's a very much internal bureaucratic thing, but it did exist on China, and it was very effective and very adequate. Uh, I, uh, when I left uh, for China in 1995, it existed. When I returned in 2000, it didn't. I don't know where it went, uh, but it, uh, uh, there's a case for it now with much wider routes uh, reach out. Just on the matter of walking and chewing gum, or as I often put it, walking both sides of the street, yes, you can do that and it's a terribly important part of what we must do. It is the art of the trade, uh, of diplomacy, but it really requires this constancy, constancy in language. Uh, it needs the avoidance of duplicity and our particular way of walking both sides of the streets at times in the past has been to say one thing to one side and another thing to another, to say one thing in public and another in private. Uh, that is what we uh, must observe, uh, avoid. Finally, just on um, the US relationship, given that I do a little bit in and around government now, let me put it this way. Some people would say uh, that part of the problem here is that, defend, that the defence and intelligence establishment within government has uh, uh, carries much too much weight relative to the traditional foreign affairs and foreign policy establishment. And that uh, uh, is in, in good part, uh, some people would say, uh, why uh, there has been such uh, uh, moves as we've seen in the last uh, 18 months, two years uh, in the defence relationship, even though people with our backgrounds might not always have been comfortable with that. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Dick, you would you always with Peter? I, think I saw some hands there. No, or maybe maybe all referring to, uh, and then you. Yeah, please. Okay, um, Robert Pritchard. If if I could offer a perspective um, of a business advisor, um, I feel that the discussion thus far has been a little narrow. Uh, if you think about the title of the white paper, it's Australia in the Asian Century. 
And I think that there ought to be more emphasis placed on the century rather than on, on the geographical region. And the reason I say that is that both inside and outside the Asian region as such, there are a number of forces at work which are bigger than us all. And I'm talking specifically about the dramatic uh, effects of globalisation as a phenomenon, which has brought with it uh, the globalisation of capital markets. It's brought with it uh, uh, environmental challenges and climate change. <coughs> it's brought with, this, uh, with it uh, a reduction in poverty, uh, both in Asia and in Africa. You've, we've seen developing countries, which were third world countries, so-called 20, 30 years ago, being uh, major powers today. Um, so the, the economic changes have been uh, enormous. Um, but the key global norm from a businessman's point of view, I think, is that uh, interdependence uh, is actually replacing the traditional view of uh, uh, political relations between countries. And when you superimpose on that the communications revolution, I think we're looking at vastly different circumstances in this decade than we were in previous decades. While all that's been going on, sovereignty has stood still. Each of our own individual countries are self-governing and remain self-governing by and large. The international economic or, or political institutions have failed to address a lot of the phenomena that I've just referred to. And that makes it more difficult for bilateral relations uh, between individual countries to uh, uh, carry on the way they, they used to. And I think that uh, makes it difficult not only for uh, the US, it makes it difficult for China, for India, for Japan, all countries, and especially including Australia. It should be relatively easy, however, not more difficult, for a small country like Australia, which is fairly uh, nimble, to accommodate these changes. It may be more difficult for a larger country such as the United States or China or Japan to do so. Uh, whether or not it's uh, relatively um, more or less difficult is something that um, is a matter of, um, of, um, of judgment. But the point I'd make in conclusion is that if interdependence is now the overriding uh, uh, global norm, uh, interdependence has got to be uh, uh, factored into uh, the traditional political obligations that apply to traditional <coughs> nation states. Thanks, Robert, and thanks particularly for giving us a, a, a point of view from business, which is such an essential part of what we should be talking about. Um, I must say, when I first uh, heard that the, the government was going to be doing a white paper on Australia and the Asian century, I thought, oh, God, why are we doing this? We worry ourselves too much about the issue. Uh, we're doing a lot of things in this country. Our businessmen are trading with, uh, China, with Asia uh, very, very effectively in many ways, many places. Our people are travelling to China, to, to Asia. Our, our, uh, our immigrants are coming predominantly from Asia. Uh, our society is being transformed in many, many ways by our ongoing engagements with Asia. And, you know, I think that we mustn't lose track of the, f of the progress that we've made and the basis from which we operate. However, I mean, I think, you know, on, on second reading, obviously there are things that have to come out of the white paper that have to be put on the table. But I fear... And as John was saying, I think once the Henry Review comes out, there'll be a lot of good stuff in it, but there's not going to be much money in it. And that's one of the problems, I think, of our political caste, of our political system. We talk about the needs, for example, to uh, have much closer engagement, much closer dialogues with China. There's no question that our failure to do this means that there are not people within the Australian Parliament who, when in government, carried out these negotiations, carried out these discussions, got to know China, 
so that when they're in opposition they understand that if governments engage in such dialogues they are doing it for good and right and proper purposes. It isn't just an opportunity for the press to have a go about the Prime Minister on yet another overseas junket. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is an inability, I think, within our political system to understand the important role of uh, political engagement in the, in the diplomatic processes. Um, so I think, again, there's a role for, for, well, as bureaucrats we have to do whatever we can. But uh, as a former bureaucrat, sorry, and for current bureaucrats, they have to do whatever they can do. But the, you do, I recall, you, you run up against this problem from time to time. You recommend that something be done. No votes in them. No votes in it, mate. No votes in foreign policy. And so, you know, you don't have that depth of engagement, that depth of knowledge, that depth of commitment to, um, to political discourse with other countries that, that you might... Uh, in Europe, where uh, you travel 50 miles and you've got to go to another country, so you've got to have an international meeting. Um, we don't have that, and we haven't had that experience. But the, you know, rest assured, there are Australian expatriates living in Jakarta, Australian expatriates living in Singapore, in Beijing, in Shanghai, in India, our migrant communities. Look around here. This is not a reflective group across the Australian community. Um, catch my 57 tram in Melbourne and you'll find what a reflective group of the Australian community is. It's Australians of Anglo-Saxon backgrounds, it's Australians from India, it's Australians from China, it's students coming from uh, anywhere in Asia. So you know, I think it's not all gloom and doom, but there are a lot of things that we have to build on. Thanks very much, Liz. So that, and that also ties in very well with what Sue was saying about you know, the, the importance of these thickening people-to-people uh, -people ties that uh, uh, are not, uh, not unimportant. Thank you, uh, Richard. Ian Budgen from ACT branch. Uh, I just want to pick up on the nomenclature issue here, because I think it is fairly important. There's a lot being said on it, some implicit, a little bit explicit. Um, we are talking in terms of the Asia century. Uh, and it comes across at times, certainly in geographic terms, that a one-size-fits-all. And I think it's very important that we don't see it as a one-size-fits-all. We look around this room, uh, certainly we're talking about China, and there's a great emphasis on China, and there indeed has to be a great emphasis on China. And I'm sure we'll put a great emphasis on India as well. But there are many other countries uh, in the Asian region uh, and if we just look along this line from Mongolia to Burma to Sri Lanka to Pakistan, um, to name a few of them, and all of them are in this Asian patch in that geographic area. And so while we can look at the area in a sense, a holistic sense, we've also got to get into the detail because from an Australian point of view, we must get into the detail and we've got to dot the I's and got to cross the T's because each are independent countries and they are all different. So yes, big picture, but it's made up of a large number of small pictures and uh, we, we can't lose sight of that fact. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, we've got time for perhaps uh, one... Uh, ladies first, if you don't mind, John. <laughs> Let's see how we go. Uh, just a brief comment, and I think to second what was said about inter-dependency inter and also people-to-people -people relationships, I think sometimes in this debate we tend to be making the assumption that there's a decision on the basis of government to go out to Asia, whereas when we really look at impacts of public diplomacy, when you look at the students who are here the inbound investment flows in business and the strength of business-to-business -business relationships. I think we're forgetting a lot of what's already here and what's already happened and what's happening. And in terms of the government's capacity to make decisions and implement them, the budget flows in terms of inbound investment from the region in Australia are far larger in many instances. So I think capital flows and business-to-business -business relationships are critical in this conversation. It's not just what happens in Canberra. Thank you. And John, uh, you'll be the last, and I know you're very good at being succinct. Thank you. Um, it, seems, it seems to me that there's some kind of emerging consensus <coughs> view that 
to increase our leverage in the region, we need to have a much more independent, adroit uh, uh, foreign policy, strategic policy. Now, in principle, that's correct, but I think we should be a little bit careful. You know, if you look at every major country in the region uh, outside China, they're moving closer or attempting to move closer and closer to America. Now, you look at a small country like Singapore. Why does Singapore have a leverage and influence way beyond its size? One reason is because it has the ear of Washington. So, you know, we have to be careful about... Well, the alliance doesn't mean compliance. It doesn't mean um, just doing exactly what all the Ameri the, that, that the American wants. But we have to be careful about talking uh, too robustly about some independent foreign policy. We have to be realistic about where Australia is positioned in the, the Asian century. Uh, we are a middle power. We are not a large power. Good. Thank you, John. Um, I think this has been a good session, a good way of getting, getting started. I'd, I'd rather hope there's somebody coming from Canberra that I could have um, uh, finished off with uh, Ian Dudgeon because the idea of having the ACT having the last word in the <coughs> Legislative Chamber of New South Wales Parliament does appeal to me. But in the end, the person who had the last word comes from Sydney anyway, so uh, I suppose we <laughs> respecting our hosts. Uh, morning tea is served in the Jubilee Room, which is back out through the foyer, if I could ask everybody to be back on time for the beginning of the next session at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, good morning again. It's the economy. Well, interesting, the, um, the dismal science, but I see that the um, public gallery is still more or less intact. People haven't gone. That's great. Welcome all. Um, of course, the reason so many people are interested in the economy, much more so than normal, I think, is really because uh, there's one key question uh, which everyone has to ask themselves and ask our experts who are here. And um, after whatever's happened to um, Beaujolais, I think it's the most interesting question in Asia today. And it's what's going to happen to economic growth? Because economic growth has been falling everywhere. Um, just a few hundred meters from here, <coughs> down in Pitt Street, the stock market analysts a year or two ago were telling us um, the Chinese economy is going to boom, boom, <coughs> boom. And those of us that decried that were ridiculed. And now we see that um, the Chinese economy is performing roughly in line with um, uh, Premier um, Wen Xiaobo's estimate of 7.5, 8%, something like that. Um, but more particularly, we, we have the news today that the Japanese economy in the last quarter has really fallen quite sharply. And then we know that the Indian economy has also um, trimmed back quite a bit. So um, welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome particularly our two uh, lead speakers here today. Um, first of all, Ambassador Nogami, who's the President of the Institute of International Affairs in Tokyo, Japan, and Professor Peter Drysdale, AM, who is head of the East Asian uh, Bureau of Economic Research at the Australian National University. And I'm going to ask um, uh, Mr. Nogami if he would be kind enough to speak first. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Well, let me first of all thank Australian Institute of International Affairs, and particularly John McCarthy, my former colleague, for inviting me to participate in this National President's Forum. As uh, previous speakers uh, mentioned, uh, my task is also uh, this morning is to trigger discussions, uh, this time on the economic aspects on Australia in the uh, Asian century. <coughs> Since I have a privilege of uh, sitting on the opposition side, I, if I'm correct, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, I can be as critical as possible. <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, in the previous session, we talked about what Asia means. <coughs> but I would like to touch upon what century means. <coughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> when one talks about the uh, economic aspects in the coming uh, decades, 
we have to take a look at the global economic conditions first. <coughs> so I would start by uh, discussing the uh, current global economic conditions uh, somewhat in a telegraphic manner because I, I'm given only five minutes and I think uh, uh, the, the bell will ring uh, anyway. <coughs> the, the world economy is, is at present uh, facing two major downside risks, as everybody knows. <coughs> First, uh, European fiscal and financial problems, and particularly responses by the uh, European governments to those uh, problems are clearly uh, leading to contraction of uh, European economy, which accounts for about one third of the global GDP. <coughs> the, uh, uh, this contraction will take place not only in the in what's called, what so-called southern peripheral countries, but also eventually in northern countries as well. <coughs> Look at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the various indices uh, in the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, not very uh, the, the, uh, promising. <coughs> the, uh, given the uh, past Japanese experiences, we went through this uh, asset bubble or the collapse of asset bubble the, uh, nearly a, a couple of decades ago. <coughs> given the uh, past Japanese experiences, it would take some years or I would say decades <coughs> before Eurozone countries uh, to get out of woods, uh, let alone come back to growth path. <clears throat> Even if a right uh, scenario is adopted, and a disaster such as Grexit, uh, and a contagion to other Euro Eurozone co economies uh, avoided. <clears throat> Second downside risk is, of course, a US economy. U.S. economy is still struggling with, uh, with the, what we call balance sheet adjustment. The, uh, both governmental and household. There's one major difference between the Japanese lost decade and uh, what is happening in the United States. That is, in the Japanese house, the, the, the lost decade, household was not damaged. Household balance sheet was damaged, not damaged. But in the U.S., household damage, a balance sheet is uh, severely damaged. And uh, that means it would take longer uh, for U.S. to recover this balance sheet adjustment. The, on top of this uh, long-lasting, long long, uh, uh, frustrating process of uh, balance sheet adjustment, the, and perhaps due to this uh, frustration of this uh, balance sheet adjustment process, uh, the, what we call the fiscal cliff is coming closer and closer. <coughs> the, given the uh, current divided uh, political situation in the United States, even the kicking the can is, uh, appear, uh, can, uh, appears to be uh, op optimistic. <coughs> the, uh, should this happen, if, uh, uh, the, the, if uh, we jump uh, the, uh, this uh, fiscal jump at the cliff, you, people say the U.S. economy will have to go through probably about four percentage point contraction. <coughs> Economic performance of Asian economies will definitely be affected by these two downside risks. Slowing down of China, some people already talked about this, slowing down of Chinese economy is one typical example. Although China appears to have uh, contained the uh, negative legacies of, uh, of the economic package adopted after 2008 Lehman crisis, uh, uh, contracting export demand to, the, to Europe and elsewhere, to the United States and uh, elsewhere, will not be substituted by massive increase of uh, fixed capital formation, as was the case in 2008. China's capital formation, uh, fixed capital formation now already accounts for nearly 50% of GDP. Uh, there is not much room uh, to expand this. Uh, <coughs> the uh, household uh, consumption is uh, increasing, 
but its relative share in GDP is not. In fact, it is decreasing. In medium term, the uh, population bonus is uh, going to disappear. Uh, in in few years time, I think uh, the uh, uh, before social safety nets uh, can be widely established. Can China come up with a new growth model? Uh, this is a very uh, important question. I'm, I'm not really sure whether this, uh, the uh, white paper is going to deal with this, these aspects, but uh, this is a big question mark. The uh, Indian economy, another BRICS country in Asia, is also showing economic strain due partly to the uh, political difficulties. India has to deal with the whole host of uh, structural problems which have been clearly exposed by the, uh, political, uh, these political difficulties. What about Japan? Mixed signs. After the disaster of March 11th, economy is modestly recovering and posting a decent growth this year, namely about 2.1 1, to 2.3 percent. Uh, due partly to the uh, reconstruction demand. Public debt and social security problems are, have been dealt with. We are going to increase uh, the consumption tax so that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, huge debt overhang will be uh, gradually be eliminated. <coughs> Nonetheless, <coughs> uh, reconstruction dam demand will dis dissipate in 2013 an increasing energy import bill, as well as uh, overvalued yen, will definitely slow down the growth in 2013. Export to China is already decreasing. Can Australian economy be independent, totally independent from these uh, uh, development? Can be unaffected by these somewhat dismal pictures? The, uh, can the can Asian economy sustain in spite of these difficult external conditions so that Asia continue to be the growth center of the world economy? Yes, I think a relative, the, 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 the growth rate of Asian countries in general will be relatively higher than that of, that of Europe or the United States. But is that going to be a sort of sort of Asian century that we have been talking about. <clears throat> Can many of uh, emerging Asian economies escape from uh, middle-income trap, the, uh, uh, given their uh, dependence on external demand? <clears throat> in the history of economic development in Asia-Pacific region, a Asia, Japan and the Republic of Korea are the only exceptions which did not go through this middle-income trap. The, uh, when the income, per capita income level gets to about $5,000, it sort of levels off. This is what is happening throughout many Asian countries. <coughs> Let me uh, conclude by my brief comment, because the bell the, the already, the, uh, by posing a question, the, uh, which has been already touched upon, uh, the, uh, which struggle, struggles over economic and foreign security policy area. About this is about so-called choice. <clears throat> Deeper commitment to the security arrange alliance with the United States on the one hand, and China as our major trading partner on the other. When the U.S. is clearly uh, moving toward uh, the uh, so-called Asia pivot, and China <laughs> increasingly showing its nationalistic and somewhat revisionistic tendencies. Uh, in the case of Japan, choice is easier. In fact, uh, our friend in China made the uh, choice much easier. <clears throat> the, uh, what about Australia? The, uh, this is going to be a very difficult task. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sun Tzu, <clears throat> a famous uh, ancient Chinese strategist, came up with a very interesting word, enko kinko, uh, be friendly, with the distant countries, but be hostile to your neighbors. 
<coughs> the, uh, uh, so uh, maybe because of uh, uh, distance, you know, the uh, uh, Australia may not have to go through very difficult uh, uh, the uh, uh, situation, <coughs> but. <coughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure whether the, uh, the, what is happening in Northeast Asia is really showing this, and also uh, the dialogue between the United States and China is in fact a sort of current day uh, practice of the Sun Tzu's strategy. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. I do hope that I'm not going to be called upon to rule on anything between China and Japan during this session. Anyway, can I um, call on uh, Professor <coughs> Peter Drysdale, who is a member of Dr. Henry's team, to continue um, to open this discussion. Thanks very much, Colin. It's a pleasure to join in this conversation about uh, Australia and the Asian century today. Uh, uh, let me say, uh, as John said at the beginning, uh, the Asian century is already with us. Uh, people have asked the question of what Asia is, and Asia is obviously uh, a plurality of political systems, cultures, uh, ideological systems, uh, and stages of economic development. But uh, it's bound together inextricably in a thousand ways by what's going on in Asia today, which is extremely big. It's bound together by the commitments that have been throughout Asia to modernization and development on a scale the world has never known before. And this is not just a matter of degree, it's a matter of substance and structure uh, that is changing the world. Uh, what's happened in Asia in the last 25 years took over 100 years to happen around the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Uh, and uh, that's transformed Asia's role in the world economy uh, to being a relatively important part of the world economy only 40 or 50 years ago uh, to accounting for about, uh, well, over 30% of world output and more of world trade today, ranking alongside Europe, as Nagami pointed out, uh, and North America certainly as a major centre of world economic power. Uh, when you get big lumps of development in Japan, in Northeast Asia, in China, in Southeast Asia, and in India happening, all cheek by jowl with each other like that, there is bound to be interdependence among developments in each of them. And it brings them together in a way that demands attention uh, by policymakers and strategists managing the process of interaction, especially if that interaction is in a global system. Uh, as I think it was Bob or somebody reminded us of, of in the earlier discussion. Uh, and I start with the global system because this is not just an Asian phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon that we're wit witnessing today. And one of the things that Asian leaders fail to understand even so long, uh, so little a time as half a decade or so ago, was how profound an impact what was going on in the region would have upon the whole structure of the world economy and world power and the management of the international economic system. Of course, uh, that's been symbolised by the need to encompass Asia within the system of global uh, governance in a way that has not happened before through the G20 process uh, around the global financial crisis, which was prompted by a failure of financial prudence in the United States and then across the world in Europe in the industrial countries, feeding back, as Nagami has said, into a more uncertain outlook around the world uh, but also a more uncertain outlook in Asia. Let me give you a slightly less dismal interpretation of the outlook in Asia, however, than Nogami presented to you. Uh, Nogami saw the downsides, and certainly downsides there are, and I'll come back to those in a moment. Uh, but uh, the positives in the developments of Asia uh, are in the emerging economies of Asia, which are the locus of the growth in Asia at this point in time, not in Japan, obviously, less in Korea, and less in the older, more mature parts of Southeast Asia, like Simon's country, <laughs> uh, but in the emerging economies of China, Indonesia, and, Indo and India in particular, uh, certainly uh, we see their potential for continuing substantial growth, if, as Nogami says, 
Uh, nonetheless, it's on an app a slightly lower pace than we've witnessed in the past. So when you look forward, as I did incidentally about seven years ago for the Asian Development Bank, and at that time they thought I was slightly crazy, and said, you know, the thing we have to worry about is not what's going on inside its Asia itself, the point Simon made in another context, but really what impact Asia will have on the rest of the world and how that will demand a new responsibility in Asia in terms of managing uh, the global economy, not just what's going on in Asia, and Asia's interest in the global regime. I want to come back to that at the end. So, uh, what's happened? Uh, we see, uh, looking forward, even at modest rates of growth, uh, Asia continuing to grow in importance in the world economy because, as Nagami has said, though he's more cautious and modest than perhaps I might be, uh, we have relatively high rates of growth in that part of the world compared with other parts of the world, barring uh, cataclysm. Uh, the uh, share of uh, Asia in the world economy will, as the Asian Development Bank itself now forecasts, uh, account for something like 52% of world output at a conservative estimate uh, in uh, 2050 and more of world trade. More than half of the world economy in our part of the world. So uh, this is substantial change and I don't care if it's 52% frankly or if it's a third that it currently is, a bit more than a third than it currently is. It'll be somewhere in between there and above a third uh, perhaps and uh, rather than closer to 52%. Uh, but that means this region demands a lot of interest and attention. Uh, 20 years out or even 10 years out, inf Asia's influence, in other words, will be even greater. Uh, by uh, 2025, which is only a short time out for somebody with my lifespan span left, uh, 2025, one in two of the world's population and four of the ten largest economies will be in Asia. And they'll likely account, as I said, uh, for a good proportion of world output. In 2010, uh, Asia's per capita income, sorry, China's per capita income, let's be specific here, was 30% of that in the United States, measured in real terms, purchasing power parity terms, as we say in economics. Uh, by 2050, even at a very modest uh, con projected rate of growth, uh, China's per capita income will be 55% uh, of that in the United States. Uh, the Chinese economy will likely be bigger than that in the United States in a couple of years' time. Uh, this is not far out at all. It's even you know, comfortably within, hopefully, within my lifespan. Asia has never uh, been of greater significance as a global economic and strategic element in the world system. Global institutional frameworks are coming to reflect this, but they're far from ready for the change that has already taken place. Uh, with uh, six members of uh, the Asian community now in the G20, including, including Australia, that's a big change and a big opportunity. Uh, and a big responsibility, actually, uh, for Asia to play its role properly uh, in manage managing the uncertainties that Nagami drew attention to in the global system uh, and uh, delivering uh, responsible inputs in terms of policy strategies that support global recovery and long-term sustainable growth. These uh, changes, of course, have had a particularly profound and rapid impact upon uh, the countries in our neighbourhood, including our own country. Uh, if you looked just uh, a little more than five years ago at the patterns of trade in our region, about 10% uh, of uh, China, uh, about 10% of regional trade was with China. Uh, and uh, uh, the United States and Japan were by far and away uh, the region's uh, largest trading partners. Uh, the share of China and, Japan and the United States in regional trade has now reversed in the last five to seven years or so, uh, with uh, China now accounting for about 23% of regional trade, 27% of Australia's, and the United States now accounting for about 10% of regional trade. 
So this is a dramatic shift in a very short space of time. That structure is embedded. That structure is likely to continue. That's a structure that we have to manage now. And that's reflected in the conversations we had this morning about the political and strategic issues. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, it's fairly obvious that our community, our national community in Australia, in thinking about these things, if we've gone out through the Asia Century White Paper process and consulted with all sorts of elements, all sorts of stakeholders in the community, uh, business groups, uh, state governments, uh, governments at all levels, the institutions, educational, non-government and so on, uh, there's a palpable expectation uh, of thinking this through for Australia through the Asian Century White Paper process. That's the good news, although it puts a terrible responsibility on the process and the government in delivering upon the process. Uh, I think uh, if you uh, think about uh, what uh, important uh, things uh, as a nation we have to think about in responding to this new circumstance, and uh, as uh, as others have said this morning, uh, we're not the only ones in this uh, circumstance. Uh, we're joined by everybody else as I move around the region talking about what we're trying to do here in Australia. The first thing people say to me is, why aren't we doing this ourselves? This is a thing we should be thinking about ourselves. And uh, I think that uh, is a mood that's strong out there too. And we'll have a lot of interest in the region in whatever comes out of the white paper process. But there are four priorities that stand out. And if you'll indulge me, Colin, I'll just briefly touch upon these four priorities. The first and obvious one is the one that uh, Ross Garner dealt with in another context uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago when he did the Northeast Asia Ascendancy Report for the Hawke government, uh, which is the need to get our de domestic and economic policy settings right in order to capitalise and manage the risks attendant upon uh, what will take place in the Asian century in the next couple of decades or so. Uh, getting our economic policy set settings right uh, requires a lot of reforms, not only at federal level, but also uh, uh, at uh, state level, the interaction between the federal and the state system. And there's a whole lot of detail there that I could talk about, both microeconomic and macroeconomic. The second thing uh, is uh, the need uh, to act uh, to deliver global outcomes uh, through regional uh, initiative and action. Uh, Asia isn't a taker now, it's got to be a giver uh, in the global process, in the protection of the public interest, the public good in the international global regime of economic governance. Uh, Asia has to be an important player and it's difficult to work out, new to the block, how to do that. And we've got to be a part of that process actively to, too, which is why we've taken an active interest in the G20 process as it relates to Asian interests. And of course, that spills over into the connection between the regional plat platforms for action like uh, APEC and the EAS uh, more actively uh, as it does into the global forums. The third thing is the need to construct a comprehensive economic and political relationships with the new big players on the block in Asia, and we've talked about that this morning in the context of China, but there's more than China involved here. Importantly with China, uh, with Indonesia, uh, and with India. Uh, not all at once, and none of these things can be all delivered at once, and I'll say something about the bottom line here in a minute. Uh, but uh, all of them, uh, carefully thought through, managed over a period of time, but initiated now, given the, given the direction for that now. And the final thing, of course, and the most important thing, perhaps, uh, is to the need to build national uh, and Asia-relevant uh, capabilities in business, in the public sector, in our educational institutions, in the community more broadly, uh, to deal with the issues that we have to deal with in confronting the Asian century. And what's true of Australia, I'm sure, is true of our neighbours around the region as they think about the developing relations with China and so on. Some have more assets in this respect than we do. We have a lot of assets that we underrate to some extent. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, quite a lot of investment already in the universities and so on, but uh, if you ask me whether, honestly, whether that's fully utilised and directed towards the purposes at hand, I've got to tell you it isn't. So we've got to elevate performance. Uh, we have assets in the form of our overseas uh, citizen citizenry. We have 30% of the Australian population born overseas. One third of that 30% is Asian born. And that's an asset that's already into play, but not as well into play as it might be. 
Uh, so there's a lot to do in terms of building Asia-relevant capabilities and literacy, uh, and uh, these assets themselves are no longer uh, adequate to the task, which is where uh, John's uh, entreaty comes in about making more resources available. Well, there won't be any uh, magic tit solution. I think that's an unparliamentary term, Colin, but there won't be any magic tit solution to this problem. Uh, resources don't come out of nowhere. You've got to make hard choices about resources like you have to make hard choices about strategy and strategic interest. Uh, those resources will come through the reallocation of resources from one part of play in government or in business or in the educational institutions to another part of play and a change fundamentally in national mindset that must elevate the interest in these things in order to deal with them adequately. Uh, it will uh, mean potentially, of course, uh, some increment in resources uh, at critical points, uh, but fundamentally the choice is about reallocating resources to priority tasks, uh, not to generating a whole lot of resources out of thin air to deal with a problem that we should be dealing with anyway. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I, I'm glad this event is being recorded so that we can um, all look at it again because I think taking notes of this is going to be rather difficult. There's quite a lot there to get into, and it's your turn to get into it now. Um, apart from the whole issue of growth, which I think is significant and important, there are many other things which are cropping up under the heading economy. One of which is that some Asian countries are losing competitiveness, uh, as shown by the International Competitiveness Report. China's one of them, India's another one. They're both down, uh, down the league table. On the other hand, Singapore is right up there as number one. Uh, sorry, Hong Kong is number one and Singapore number two, I think. So uh, competitiveness is an issue and Australia's competitiveness in all of this is absolutely vital and fundamental. So we might want to get into that. The second thing is that um, Australia, so that China is moving away uh, from some of these low-end manufacturing processes and looking to go up market, and that's another trend we're seeing um, to face competition from Europe. Uh, there was a piece in the New York Times yesterday uh, which showed that a Philips factory in Holland using robots um, had one-tenth of the labour force with more output than its current factory in China. And so, I don't know that we've got too many scientists here, but robotics and the use of robotics is actually also changing the economics of the whole of this region. Um, and then, I think the other thing I just want to make a point about as we open for discussion is that um, all kinds of other economic issues, which are really domestic Australian issues, are dragged into this. One of them is migration. Have we got the right kind of migration policy? And I'm not talking about asylum seekers here. I'm talking about where we're going to get the 50,000 engineers we need for the gas industry, for example. What about population growth? Um, there was a debate about um, easing, you know, not having a big Australia, but um, do we owe it to our Asian friends to actually look towards a big Australia? Environment is absolutely critical here. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a big issue right across Asia, of course, but it's also a big issue in our dealings with Asia. And, um, and then there's food security. Um, should Australia be looking much more into uh, developing proper food programs, food manufacturing programs for, um, for, for tr trade and sales to Asia? Now, um, can I ask you, I, I, please, to identify yourselves um, by name and organisation, if you're from an organisation. I've got a crib sheet with pictures, but unfortunately it's a bit like passport photos. It doesn't always work. I know a lot of you, but I don't know all of you. But more to the point, we have um, people up there in the pub public gallery who probably don't know many of you at all. So it would be very helpful if um, each of you could um, identify yourself, even if you're well known to each other. Thank you. Who'd like to kick all this off? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jeffrey Ewing, AIA in Queensland. Um, I'd like to um, just take up um, on Peter's eloquent uh, 
um, talk to us and his four needs, which he, he very well identified that uh, Australia faces, but particularly the last point in relation to um, coming to grips with how we deal perhaps socially with, uh, with the economic advances that we're going to see uh, in the Asian region over the next, uh, <coughs> over, the, over this century, excuse me. <coughs> I particularly want to perhaps focus on just the issues of public and social diplomacy and of course uh, Peter made the, the point towards the very end of his uh, remarks that uh, it may be something of an incremental uh, reallocation of resources to, uh, to deal with uh, that which we are going to have to deal with across <coughs> these various issues which confront us. But again, I guess this takes up on John McCarthy's introductory points that really it's not an incremental um, reallocation of resources which we're going to need. It's, a, it's going to uh, mean a great leap forward, I think, in Australian attitudes and certainly in governmental attitudes in, in terms of increasing our diplomatic efforts and the education of our populace to take the, uh, the community along, along the road to embracing uh, the Asian society in which we live. Um, I'd certainly be interested in other people's uh, comments on that. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Richard Bronowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'd like to say to Peter, his four priorities are, are very interesting, but to my mind, I'd like him to be a little bit more specific. The first is economic settings. We've got to get them right. OK, give us a few examples. Secondly, deliver global outcomes through regional actions. I guess that's another thing I'd like to get some more specificity on. The third one is new political relations with our neighbours. Well, hell, that's what we've been doing for a long time. And if the government and the opposition would get off their backs to do it, if we built up our foreign service so that we could have uh, an acceleration of the political relations with our neighbours would be a jolly good thing. And finally, the need to build national and Asia relevant capabilities, fine. The first thing that comes to my mind is language, and unfortunately, uh, our universities are now almost bereft of Asian language uh, technologies and, and teachers for the students that need it. And I must say, it always hurt me a great deal to see that young diplomatic uh, young diplomats in Canberra were recently, and it's a phenomenon that, that I've seen and I've been disturbed about, have been more anxious to go to Europe than they have to Asian countries because they're too tough. So Peter, may I ask you if you could reply, give us a couple of examples of e getting our economic settings right, if you would. Maybe I'm just asking something that's pretty fundamental <coughs> to you, but not to me. And also, what do you mean about global outcomes through regional action? Could you give us a, another example of that, please? Peter, could you answer that reasonably expeditiously? Take a few more questions. Take a few more questions. Take some more questions. All right, you'll come, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute. Yeah. Well, while I'm, well, um, can, I, can I ask him, uh, if I may, uh, it would be very useful, I think, just to hear briefly from Dr. Uh, Ruan, uh, who is um, from the China um, Institute of Studies uh, in Beijing, who is, you're going to hear from him in a later debate, and I don't want to preempt what he says, but he did tell us yesterday evening that um, in order for China to stand still at its present level, it needs to create enough jobs each year, the equivalent of the entire Australian population. And so um, I wouldn't mind hearing from him as to whether he thinks that's possible. Uh, and whether China is going to be able to um, keep up with um, the current Premier's um, uh, forecast of 7.5% growth. Could I invite you to uh, <laughs> make a comment on that, please? Well, it's a kind of preemptive strike. <laughs> I, I didn't anticipate that. Anyway, thank you very much to give me this opportunity to see a few words about uh, basically what you mentioned about uh, 20 million job opportunities for China. 
I, I know it sounds weird and pretty strange, but by Chinese standard, it's not a big deal. Uh, well, I think it's the first thing for the Chinese policymakers in their mind every morning when they wake up, how to create job. This is the same. And I guess I, I can recall a little bit uh, when Jiang Zemin, uh, I guess, met uh, President Bush and they talked about many other international issues. But one of the question, and it seems President Bush asked John, so what is the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? John said, I'll create about over 20 million job opportunities. So this is the absolute the priority. And well, it is also a mission of impossible. You know, every year in China, we will have over 6 million graduates from universities. 6 million. And plus those migrant workers from rural area to the urban area. So enormous people, they are seeking for job opportunities. And so that turns out to be what kind of opportunity and possibility uh, the Chinese government can provide for them. So the answer actually is to keep the economic growing. So sometimes 8% growth is the magic number. You've got to keep this economic growth above 8% in order to generate enough uh, job opportunity for them. But of course, the second quarter, according to the report, China's economy has been, for the first time in decades, moved back to 7.6%. So this was a uh, headline also in China, as I understand abroad. And I think that the government is pretty conscious about it. So I guess I'm pretty confident the government is very capable as they have a lot of resources and also policy options to uh, revitalize the growth of this economy. One of the things, for example, is China is under huge, very profound um, transformation of urbanization. For the first time, the Chinese population, urban population, for the first time overtake the population in rural area. So that means, what, what does that mean in number? That's over 600 million people <coughs> lived in urban area. So this will provide enormous input for uh, resources, of course, and also for, for job opportunities for them. And secondly, I think having done a great job in the last 30 years, I think Chinese has accumulated very, very uh, kinds of, various kinds of uh, experience and uh, to deal with this up and downs. You know, it's a dilemma for Chinese policymakers. We don't want the economy to be too hot or heated economy. But that, that will create tension as well because you cannot provide enough oil and gas and the resources to support it. It will be sustainable, unsustainable. But in the same time, we'll try to keep in a, uh, in the certain growth that can be manageable. Uh, so I, th I guess in the third quarter or in the fourth quarter, it will rebound. It will rebound. After, uh, of course, there are some people talking about maybe there is a possibility for new stimulus, but I, I will be very cautious about it. And you know the, the massive stimulus after the financial crisis in 2008? There are some downsides. For example, the inflation came out, and uh, it's a kind of a tiger, a lot of, uh, put the tiger outside the cage. Well, this is why we put it. So that will be very dangerous. So I, I'm pretty cautious about the new wave of a stimulus uh, approach for that. But make, make it uh, sure that it will rebound in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard Brinovsky um, raised the issue of Asian languages, and I know that's going to be in the report. Uh, it's been well trailed that uh, we need to do more about Asian languages. I, I know of quite a few young people who have 
uh, devoted their lives in recent years to the study of Asian languages and Asian study politics and so on, and they find it almost impossible to get jobs. Uh, there are no jobs for them. So um, the promise of a great future, if only you'll uh, become fluent in Indonesian or Mandarin, um, it just seems a bit of a mirage. And in fact, in the tea break just now, I was talking to a young man who actually is up in the gallery there, who um, uh, has a lot of experience in Asia, uh, speaks Indonesian, is facing the same problem. And it does seem that business in Australia, banks, uh, all the major banks, uh, many other organizations just say, oh, well, we can get people um, who, uh, who, who uh, uh, all, everyone in China, everyone in Japan speaks English, so we don't need to bother about that. So I'm wondering whether this is a bit of a mirage, and it's not for me to express my views, although I've probably broken the rules by doing that just now, but I know that uh, Jeff Miller, um, one of, our, one of the people in the audience here wrote a piece in Loewy's Interpreter recently on this, and I wonder whether you might like to make a couple of comments, Jeff. Well, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I, I do agree with, uh, with what you said, that in the past, anyway, it has proved a bit of a mirage for uh, students of Asian languages who then look to go into a business career uh, which will be facilitated by the, by the knowledge of whatever the language was. And I think that... Um, I, I believe that Australian firms have been uh, reluctant to attach a lot of importance to uh, a, a job seeker's knowledge of, of an Asian language. Uh, I think that contrasts really, for example, with um, some of the countries with which we uh, do a great deal of business, for example, with Japan. And I think uh, uh, members of Japanese trading companies uh, posted around the world typically uh, go through a, an elaborate process of uh, language familiarisation for the country in which they're going to be posted. Uh, my knowledge of all this is a bit out of date. It go, really goes back to my time uh, uh, in Japan in the late 80s. But uh, I think that at that time anyway, uh, our major resource firms which were selling enormous amounts of their products to Japan <coughs> tended to be doing that through intermediaries which were in fact uh, Japanese intermediaries, the trading houses or agents that they specifically appointed uh, in Japan to uh, operate on their behalf. Now those people may have been uh, very able and uh, did a, a good job for the firms in question but I think there is just the, the issue of uh, were our firms really familiar enough with the environment in which they, into which they were trying to sell? Did they have people who understood the society in which they were operating? Uh, could they pick up the nuances of what was happening or likely to happen in, in, the, in, in, in Japan? And certainly they set out to do that through intermediaries, but I just uh, wonder whether that's good enough and whether particularly it will be good enough in the future if, as people believe, uh, we will be able to uh, look to a future in which services, provision of services, plays a much bigger part. If we are talking about uh, legal firms, financial firms, uh, education consultancies and so on, operating in a, a different society, they surely must be able to react to nuances within that society and how it works. And uh, I think it is important that um, uh, our firms uh, think in that way. Now, of course, uh, a, an employer will also want to know that the person he is about, he or she is about to employ, uh, is relevant to the, that firm's business, as well as being able to speak a particular language. But I don't think there's any contradiction really 
between those two things. What it could mean is uh, a somewhat longer period of preparation for the, the job seekers in question. In other words, a professional qualification plus an Asian language. Now, if the Asian language teaching had begun in secondary school, for example, that need not be too much of a burden because by the time the person in, certain term in question got to university, they'd have a basis in whatever the language was. I do think, though, that we've fallen back a bit in recent years. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, my daughter studied Indonesian at a primary school in Canberra. When she went to secondary school, she studied Japanese. I'm not sure that now it would be, and that wasn't regarded as particularly extraordinary, but I'm not sure that that would be so prevalent now. I think we may have actually fallen back in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Quick point to something you said, if I may, very yep. quickly. Uh, by saying they all speak English, we don't have to speak their language, with respect, is leaving the playing field open to them. And as Jeff said, learning a language coupled with, and I should have added this, coupled with some sort of uh, commercial expertise or legal expertise is very important for Australians. And that's part of the gearing ourselves into being able to deal with, with these people. It's not just learning the language. The language indicates the culture, the way of thinking, the way things are done. I've struggled, God knows, with Japanese for so many years, and I'm still not very fluent, but it certainly has helped me a great deal in that country, as, as my Spanish did in Mexico. But, you know, it's extremely important, and, and we cannot, I suggest, dismiss the lack of interest in learning Australian language, uh, Asian languages in Australia by saying, oh, they all speak our language, it doesn't matter. No, I wasn't suggesting that, actually. Um, somebody, yes, through here, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Unendra Jay, uh, Professor of Asian Studies uh, from the University of Adelaide. Can you hear me? Uh, You're Composition <laughs> or? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Punendra Jayat from the University of Adelaide uh, and also President of Asian Studies Association of Australia. Uh, about this language issue, um, I think uh, the notion that uh, learning an Asian language uh, is a ticket uh, to employment, this notion is, is wrong in my view. Uh, there are two aspects of uh, learning an Asian language or Asian languages. One is, um, as children, kids learn painting or maths or science or any other subject at primary or secondary level, which prepares them to develop a kind of rounded personality. I think language learning should be uh, taken uh, in that perspective. That's one aspect of uh, learning language. And some of the speakers and commentators have already made the point uh, that we need to be sensitive about their culture, their language, their society, and, and learning language provides one, uh, uh, one way of doing that. The second aspect of language learning is, is for professional purposes. That is, you want to do research on Japan or China or whatever, you learn that language as I have done, or you want to be uh, expert on the Chinese uh, legal system or Japanese legal system, so you learn the language along with your law degree. Uh, you want to be an accountant and you want to work in a company, Chinese company or Japanese company, you learn that language. So my point is that uh, the notion that this language learning necessarily prepares just uh, for employment is plainly and simply incorrect. So we need to think in terms of this Asian century and what does this language learning mean? It, it has got different meanings. Thank you very much. Thank you. As soon as I... Uh, Gary, what uh, I'd just like to say that I thought that... Um, uh, Mr. Ryan Zhongzhi was being a little too modest when he, in talking about the problems of uh, finding employment for 25 million Chinese a year, didn't mention China's population control policy, which I think most of us think uh, was one of the great achievements of the 
modern era. This will mean, of course, that within a couple of generations, China itself will have a problem of aging population, people like me. We would look forward to Japan and China, Japan having attended to this problem uh, quite constructively for the last generation, uh, cooperating in this area in three or four generations' time to the great benefit of the rest of the world. Interesting point. Yeah. The lady there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. My name is Dr. Angeline Lowe, and I'm a research fellow at the University of Technology, Sydney. Now, I'd like to talk about entrepreneurship and employment and immigration. Uh, we, when we talk about business and, and, and uh, economic growth, we tend to think in terms of the big boys, the big businesses, the mining, the, the, the um, big corporations uh, operating here. Now, we for, tend to forget the small businesses and the role of immigrants in, in Australia itself in terms of um, creating employment. Immigrants, um, especially from Asia, has the highest rate of um, participation in, in small business development. And uh, their role also with the, with the network overseas, and I feel that we have not given them enough recognition and also enough uh, support uh, for them to grow their businesses further. And um, so I, I'm uh, commenting on this that uh, we have ignored the assets that we have, you know, brought in from overseas and created here, and yet we have not nurtured them and allowed them to grow, uh, you know, for, for the benefit of, of Australia, as well as, you know, our participation in Asia. Thank you. Um, maybe I could ask um, Professor Drysdale to come back and... Um... Sorry, there's somebody, there's somebody up there. Thank you. I totally agree with the last speaker. It's a, a phenomenal asset that we have that we're not leveraging. I just wanted to make the point that I'm Jenny McGregor from AsiaLink. Sorry, I just wanted to make the point that um, more than a year ago now we set up a, a task force called the Asia Capable Workforce Task Force, which is a really dreadful name. Um, nonetheless, it has had enormous support from a range of business people. Mike Smith. Um, Thank you very much, Warwick. Um, CEO of the uh, of ANZ is the chairman, and it has a number of Australia's leading CEOs, as well as representation from small business, and it has the Business Council of Australia and Australia in Australian Industry Group represented. On the 6th of September, it will report, but the, the work that it's done is based on research of Australian businesses, and Australian businesses, in response to our survey, have identified the fact that Asia is clearly where the opportunities are, but they don't believe that they have the current. They don't currently believe they have the expertise to really fully leverage this opportunity. So we've done a lot of work um, with a lot of support from a range of um, businesses, and I have to say, all of this has been contributed pro bono. Um, we've, we've drilled down into what kind of expertise do businesses want, what, um, what sorts of skills, what kinds of knowledge, what kinds of attributes do we need in our people, and how do we get there. And uh, we've worked very closely, thank you Peter, with the uh, White Paper Task Force, and um, on the 6th of September in Sydney, Mike will be launching this work. and. Uh, launching a national strategy to build an Asia-capable workforce. And happily, it is certainly very focused on not just the big guys, but really leveraging the opportunity of small and medium enterprises, picking up on the assets of our Asian-Australian community. And um, so we're pretty excited about, hopefully, some new initiatives coming out of that. And I think that we certainly, um, on the earlier discussion about Asian languages, it is really tough to see our students who have worked hard on their Asian languages having a, a struggle getting jobs, but the people on this task force have been enormously positive and also very clear about the fact that business needs to play a role going forward. Business needs to signal to the community that they care about these skills and they're prepared to reward them. 
And I think that certainly from my point of view, I talk to a lot of business people, and, it, I've, and I have done for a long time, as many of you know, and for a long time we've sort of felt like a bit of a fringe group out there, rabbiting on about this weird thing that nobody quite understood. Now it's a complete no-brainer. Everybody gets it, and everybody gets the fact that we've got to have Asia capabilities, we've got to employ Asia-skilled people. Thank you. Jenny, Jenny, could, could I just ask you, um, your survey, to what extent did it measure what people felt about the risk? Because we've not talked about yeah. risk in Asia. Um, obviously, ANZ Bank and Mike Smith have taken uh, great strides there yeah. and have uh, moved forward, but other people are fairly risk averse. What's your assessment? What's your organization's assessment on risk? I know it's, yeah, it's a, a wide huge. question, and there's a big difference between risk in India and risk in China, yeah. risk in yeah. Japan, but what, what's your overall, overall view? Yeah, it's a key, a very key issue, and one of the points that's been raised consistently is is that um, the boards and the senior executive and the heads of small and medium sized enterprises have to really um, an analyse risk carefully, but they've also got to uh, bring their communities alongside with them. So shareholders in the case of big business, analysts in the case of big business, can provide real challenges um, because, you know, I mean, some people have said to us, um, shareholders don't like Asia, it's scary. And um, so that whole issue that I think Peter alluded to earlier about the, um, the need with, that the White Papers recognise for a broader community understanding is absolutely crucial. If we don't have a broad community who are, after all, the shareholders and the analysts in our society, then it is really tough for business to go out there. But, you know, we all know that the stories are told about, you know, what companies lost their arms and their legs in Asia. But the stories about the companies that lost their arms and their legs in the UK or in the US are not quite so readily told. I think we also um, need the media on board with this one because the good news stories, as we know, don't get told. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, lady there. Uh, in our diplomatic graduate program this year, out of 50 graduates selected, 26 of them speak for one of four Asian languages. Uh, so, you know, it's a very conscious effort to sustain our Asian literacy in DFAT. Should I also say that uh, across our very modest public diplomacy program, modest in terms of funds, but we have wonderful programs that are more and more concentrating on young people interacting with Asia. We have the Australian Indonesia Institute within DFAT that um, has what they call a bridging program. And they, at the late primary and secondary schools, they have exchanges of students that go and spend a month, two months, three months in Indonesia, and Indonesian students coming to Australia. And of course, the obvious intent is to have that interaction at Asia literacy starting at a very early age. So we're very, very hopeful that the white paper may help us empower such activities more and more. It is very much that broad, diplomacy, people-to-people -people diplomacy, starting uh, at the youngest possible levels and interacting between Asia and Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm conscious the clock's ticking away fast, and I know that uh, Peter Drysdale wants to answer Richard's questions. And uh, we could probably pass, I think, on the Asian language as well, because we've had a fairly thorough debate on that, but maybe you could uh, uh, succinctly answer the others. Thank you very much. That's a challenge, but I think the conversation underlines that this is a, a national task that extends well beyond government, and the white paper process will fail unless it engages uh, constituencies well beyond government in changing the mindset, the incentives, the benchmarks and the priorities uh, that are in all elements of our society uh, to deal with the issues that we need to deal with in the decades ahead. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, I'm encouraged by this. Jenny reported 
a process which is well underway alongside this process. But the white paper process has stim stimulated many such processes in our institutions, at the state government level, a number of the states and territories are committed to doing their own Asia Century white papers flowing out from this process, and that will make the carry for forward on the work of the uh, white paper process itself hopefully much, much more effective than it otherwise would be. Uh, Dick asked uh, a number of specific questions and let me respond to them. Uh, and on the first one, uh, the question about uh, regional action for global outcomes, it re really relates to the points that Nogami was making quiet, quietly there before about the need to reposition uh, 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 Asian policy strategies in order uh, to deliver a sustainable uh, global growth. Uh, it, it, the reposition is a national reposition in China, for example, uh, to shift from an export-oriented investment-led growth strategy to a consumption-led growth strategy, but also to investment in infrastructure, which is productive investment in infrastructure. And that's not just a Chinese problem. It's an Indonesian problem. It's an Indian problem. It's not an accident, therefore, that the Chinese, the Indians, the Indonesians have worked closely with us to get this full frontal onto the agenda of the G20 uh, process and make that a leading edge of Asia's contribution to global uh, recovery and longer term sustainable growth. Uh, on uh, Australian policy settings, a whole raft of things there, and I, I won't even try to list them all, but yeah, take the environmental set of issues, for example, and the way in which regulatory structures across our country, across the levels of government impact upon the ease of doing business around environmental regulation in Australia. That's not a done deal by any stretch of the imagination. So we've got a lot of work to do on that front, but a whole range of fronts which will make us much more integrated with the Asian economy. Like Simon's story about how Australia and Singapore are pretty well integrated, despite his little uncertainties about how easy it is to do business in Australia for Singaporeans that own half the country here quietly. Uh, that, that, that is happening, uh, but there needs to be a lot of regulatory reform and change which will play into both regional and global uh, processes uh, to make effective. Uh, I think uh, the final uh, point I make is about this capacity thing, uh, the national capacities. Uh, Jeff Miller was absolutely right. You, know, uh, you, don't, uh, you have to do more than speak a language in order to be uh, capable in the affairs of, of the country of that language or area of that language. Uh, but uh, what we do know from experience, and I've been teaching kids for a very long time here, what we do know from experience is that uh, if you, uh, for example, do a survey of kids who've done a combined degree in Asian studies, like Japanese or Indonesian, and economics, whether or not they go out in the business uh, and get uh, a job directly related to Japan or to Indonesia or whatever, uh, they get a premium on their salary of first employment. We, we've measured these things. And so it's valued out there in the community. This is a task, of course, that won't change through you know, a particular initiative at a particular point in time. It, it involves changing, as uh, others have observed, uh, the mindset of business in recruitment and the structures and so on. And it needs more people like, like Warwick Smith here at the top of business who get it, uh, where uh, by culture norm, incentive structures and benchmarking in the past, we haven't delivered people to the top of business who get it. Uh, but uh, uh, a national process of engagement on these things that encourages people to get it and set new standards and set new priorities is an important part of getting there. Okay, well, um, I think it's time for lunch. Um, we've had a good um, airing of a whole number of economic issues. Many more we could have tackled, um, but there we are. Um, lunch is going to be served where you had coffee in the Jubilee Room. Hope you'll all come through have lunch with us there, continue the discussion, and then please be back here for the next session promptly at one o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you for reconvening so promptly and tidily. Uh, this um, uh, session uh, is about uh, strategic and political affairs, as uh, John McCarthy said uh, in his opening remarks. I think Richard reflected it too. Um, it is a pity to have to separate uh, strategic issues from the economy and all of that from politics because after all they are all about the same sort of human agency. 
but uh, pity as it is, it's unavoidable. It's regrettable, though, because it reflects the uh, nature of discussion in Australia about much of Asia and in particular about China. It's a debate, so-called, that runs along two lines, two parallel tracks. Uh, a debate, a discussion about the economic weight of China in a, for Australia and discussion that happens across on the other parallel track about uh, the potential risks of the conflict and China's militarization and so on. Uh, we all hope, uh, Peter, we all hope very much that the Asia Century White Paper will bring these tracks together and that uh, uh, oddly as the terms of reference have been written, uh, political and strategic affairs will be the starting point uh, and that the white paper will set the context for the defence white paper rather than allowing the two to proceed in parallel in the future. Two people who are able to bridge those sort of parallel tracks are Dick Walcott and uh, Professor Ruan Tongji. We've heard uh, much about China today but so far uh, not from uh, anyone from China. Uh, Dr. Rongji, Dr. Ruan, uh, we welcome you very sincerely. Dr. Ruan, of course, is the uh, Vice President of the uh, China uh, Institute of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs and a former diplomat himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's my great honor here uh, to speak about a Chinese perspective. How do we look at Asia, how do we look at the China, Asia, uh, uh, Australia relationship. First of all, let me extend my sincere thanks. I'm so grateful for the AWIA's hospitality and your generosity to make my way here possible. And I already had a wonderful few days here, uh, except the Sydney, I had a good day in Melbourne as well. And I, I guess, AWIA has done a tremendous job, particularly to organize this debate. And I think this uh, discussion has been very timely. And the topic is particularly uh, of great significance. Um, well, as I was told at the very beginning this morning, this is the oldest parliament. And uh, this is also, I understand, a discipline setting. setting. So the previous speakers has set the bar so high, so I'll try to do whatever possible to match that. So I can assure you there is no surprise, no fireworks, but surely I have an uh, obligation to keep you guys awake after such a nice lunch. <laughs> and so I will briefly, very briefly address three points. The first one is how do we look at the Asia in the future? Uh, there is no question, no doubt about Asia century is emerging. I guess if anyone doubt this, you will miss the chance. And surely, according to their uh, previous speakers, has uh, uh, given lots of data to show that. As a matter of fact, one of the data, according to IMF, its projection that by 2030. Asia economy will, the, will be the largest one in the world. So how could we uh, pretend not to see this will happen? As a matter of fact, it is uh, happening every day. Thanks to our efforts, thanks to the members in this region, they are working so hard. And particularly when you look, at, look around the world, um, the European Union they will be struggling for their debt crisis issue for years to come. And so the, there is a pretty gloomy outlook for the world economy in the foreseeable future. But Asia, it turns out to be so dynamic. We weather the storm of the financial crisis, unprecedented. Many of Asia economies, including Australia, has done much better job than its peers. And so there are many others emerging countries, of course, including China, India, Indonesia, so and so. So we should have enough confidence that this kind of emerging Asia century will surely shape the global and the regional landscape and the prosperity. And it will also have an enduring and profound result in the future. 
And secondly, of course, this has happened. There are not all reasons you can attribute to that. But for me, I think there are two reasons or two elements are so crucial that play a part for this keep growing and continue prosperity. First of all, Asia has been enjoying the peace in the last three decades or so. And no major conflict really broke out. So that really provides a very conducive international settings for the economy to really focus on their domestic agenda. Of course, in the same time, another factor is so important. Meanwhile, we have witnessed the mushrooming of the institution building here in Asia. You have uh, various kinds of institutional building, and uh, thanks to, for example, Australia's work, uh, uh, efforts, we have APAC, and uh, then we have uh, 10 plus 1, 10 plus 3, and uh, EAS, all this stuff. That, it turns out to be uh, built a very solid foundation network for, to power this economy to grow. Uh, currently, I guess the very encouraging news is China, Japan, South Korea were also engaged to kick off. China already kicked off the talk with South Korea about the FTA. So this will be a tremendous input if there is any significant progress has been made. Of course, I understand that China has been working with Australia for the FTA issues. I hope it could make better or greater progress in the future. So on one hand, we, ha we have witnessed some of the problem and disputes, but underneath, there is a tremendous effort going on internally to build, to close, link these countries together. Because we cannot just lose our sight on the, a greater picture and to share the prosperity. And of course, the power distribution in Asia has been, uh, been multi multilateralized. This we do believe it's a positive um, trend. And for China, as a, let me just very briefly about China. China has become the number two GDP economy, but we don't have any kind of sense of celebration. As a matter of fact, we recognize there is a tremendous daunting task ahead of us. We must adjust, for example, make the structural reform to make the economy more sustainable. And also, we have lots of homework to do before we can become a really sustainable economic growth model or way. And so, as a matter of fact, this gives China a chance to do some soul searching work to rethink what we are going to do next. So we are totally aware of the, those challenges. Um, OK, let me come back to my second point. That is, I have to say, China-US relationship. Uh, my experience working in Washington in the last four more years tells me a great deal about how this relationship has been transformed uh, profoundly. Two things, let me tell you that. I like to use this opportunity to think. One, one thing is this relationship has been moving from the traditional bilateral relations to a more global dimension. And we are talk almost everything under the sun. Not, not just restricted to the bilateral issues, you, you know all of this, but we also talk many others. So the dialogue has been tremendous. Uh, secondly, I think we established a very well uh, uh, there are tremendous, uh, well-established network mechanisms, over 60 communications mechanisms between the two countries. And top of them, at the top of them, called China-US Strategic and Economic Dialogue, and uh, headed by Chinese Vice Premier Wang Qishan, State Councilor Dai Bingguo, and respectively, the US side is headed by Hillary Clinton and the Tim Geithner, the, the finance ministers. And of course, under this huge umbrella, we also developed the initiative many others. I'd like to give you two cases. One is 2010, 
we initiated the two uh, very interesting dialogue. One is the security dialogue. And uh, there are some problems between China and the United States. So we are pretty frank and candid discussing. So we, we can we talk about, uh, for example, American su surveillance uh, near the China's coast area. Also, we talk about cybersecurity, uh, so, those sort of things. And another, another dialogue called the Asia Affairs Consultation. This is a deputy foreign minister's level. And the Chinese side is headed by Chui Tiankai, vice foreign ministers, and the US side is headed by Kirk Campbell. So every six months, they come together to talk about basically about what is going on in Asia and what China and the US has a better communication on that. And the last about this China-US relationship is actually uh, very recently, China initiated uh, a, a kind of new thinking about how to approach the United States. Uh, that is what we call new type of major relationship. Well, I hope you can be uh, aware of this. American uh, echo pretty positively. They agree that China and the United States cannot afford to go to fall in the trap of a zero-sum game. We got to build up our trust, uh, build in order to have a win-win situation. And so having said this, of course, it's very important for people to people, uh, just now uh, in, the, in the morning, we have touched upon people to people relationship. Now, one of the things that might be interesting for you is Obama, when he came to the White House, he had a very ambitious goal. He proposed to send 100,000 US students to China in his first term. 100,000 U.S. students. And the Chinese government were extremely positive, so we provide some scholarship for, to facilitate the progress. Uh, of course, with regard to this, China and U.S. also established a very senior level people-to-people -people consultation. The Chinese side headed by Liu Yandong, another state councilor. The U.S. side headed by Hillary Clinton herself. So just a focus to mobilize the people, the, the students, the women, the sportsmen, or whatever, you, you name it, to, so to consolidate the people-to-people -people foundation of that. So we think this is a very uh, positive for the future. Uh, so I don't think that the South China Sea, of course, recently flared up to the other world. That is not the hope about China-US relations. Also, China, it is not an issue between China and the United States. We just uh, hope that the U.S. will play a, a, a more uh, constructive role here. Let me come to the third part about how China and you, uh, China Australia relationship. I guess when when I first saw this, uh, the title of this discussion, I had uh, it struck me that it seems Australia has been so keen trying to catch the opportunity. So the narrative here is that Australia, England, Asia, Central, I do think it's a pretty positive effort to shape the Australian society to understand what, will, what is going on in Asia and what they are going to do about Asia. So this is fundamentally important. I guess the Asia Central as, as a whole, it provides a very good opportunity for China and the US, uh, not the US, not only the US, but also Australia to work together. And you know, in the last 40 years, in the last 40 years uh, after the globalization of our relationship, our trade, economic trade has doubled more than a thousand times, more than a thousand times. So there's also tremendous potential. And in China, as I said, we will speed up the urbanization. So there's other priorities like energy resources and safety planning, clean energy, and all this, Australia has an edge to play a, a more important role. So uh, to conclude that I think we, China and Australia, uh, meet, confront uh, unprecedented opportunity for us. And we, Strongly believe that by working with each other, we will achieve, achieve a great deal. But having said this, I have to take one, two, 20 seconds. 
to talk about a little about American people to Asia, and then it's it might it's an impact on uh, Australia. And for me, for forgive my frankness, I think that Americans military ties with Australia or Australia recently provide uh, strengthen the military ties is unnecessary and it causes some concern, unnecessary concern in China. Uh, maybe you guys think it's not a big deal, a few hundred uh, of marine, but for, for some people outside, you able to build up this consciousness. I think you can handle much better than it you has done. So I think Australia has a chance to choose or to do, to play. That is to say Australia can play a part as a kind of an interlocutor of the relationship between China and the United States. When China and the United States confront with each other, it's no good for everyone, including Australia. Well, if they work together, it will benefit all of us. So I think in this respect, Australia does have a choice. You can do better. I, I'm pretty confident. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wan, and there's much in there that I'm sure that our colleagues will want to pursue with you. Thank you very much. Uh, as moderator, I'm very pleased to uh, uh, welcome Dick Wilcott. Uh, many have tried to moderate Dick over the years without uh, a lot of success. Uh, uh, Dick, uh, I was saying to someone at lunchtime, uh, you could argue that the Asian century goes back to 1905, um, now, you haven't been around all that long, but your perspective is a long one, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Moderator, Richard, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think the most, the most important and uh, uh, topical foreign strategic policy issue facing Australia today is the urgent need for both um, the government and the opposition to determine more appropriate and more balanced in our relations with the United States and China as the emerging superpower. Uh, some of these things have been said before, but that's the fate of the uh, after last speaker, I think, as you will discuss it also. This is the fundamental issue the White Paper uh, must uh, frankly address, and the government uh, and uh, the opposition will do the country a disservice. Uh, if policy is just allowed to do it, uh, they don't look ahead and persist with what I would regard as somewhat outdated policies rooted in the past, which is overtaken us, if it hasn't already done that. We are at a, a sort of ticking point. Um, so I congratulate the Australian Institute of International Affairs on, on staging the, uh, this event. Uh, I'd like to start with a couple of um, but general generic comments, because a lot of people think it's having to define Asia. Uh, Asia is really a Western geographical description of a, of a huge region of great political, religious, and social diversity. And, uh, it includes uh, three monarchies, um, two of the world's not three largest democracies, four countries still administered by communist party governments, and the extensive practice of world's four main religions. So it's a huge and complicated area. Um, we need, from an Australian point of view, I mean, what does the Asian century matter to Australia? From the Australian point of view, we need to <coughs> accept the reality that Australia is permanently situated in the Southeast Asian and Southwest Pacific region, and that our adjustment to this reality is going to determine success or otherwise of our diplomatic, commercial, and strategic future. Uh, the idea that we do not have to choose between our history and our geography, complicated uh, continuously by John Howard over a long period of time, is simplistic and has been politically extremely cliche. Our history is our past, some of it is shameful, some of it is noble. Um, but our future really lies in our geography. <clears throat> the potential importance of Asia and the need for Australia to adjust to this geographical environment is, as Rick and others have said, is not, of course, new. Um, 
What is new however, is the urgency for us created by the unprecedented transfer of wealth from the West to the East, which will continue in the foreseeable future. And this greatly changed situation in the Asia Pacific region, driven of course by the spectacular rise of China in particular, but also by the rise of India and um, indeed building on the continuing strength of um, uh, Japan and South Korea, conditions the growing potential of Indonesia, which was already mentioned this morning, and Vietnam. This is a historic turning point to which Australia must respond. Now, we do live in a much more interconnected world than we did in the times of the Cold War with the uh, former Soviet Union. Um, and we live in a world in which the major power relationships much more closely intersect. This is where the, in Asia, is where the template for the um, United States-China relationship uh, will uh, uh, largely be shaped. It's also the crucible where the international relationships on a whole range of Asian issues between the United States, China, Japan, India, Russia, Indonesia, South Korea, and the main uh, ASEAN economies will be forged. Um, I'll turn now to what should Australia do to cement its place in, uh, in, in Asia. I think, first of all, we need a fundamental change to our national psyche. Focus much more on Asia than our traditional links with the United States, the United Kingdom, and Europe. We also need a continuous and sustained, rather than a spasmodic and rhetorical focus for the countries of Asia. Um, and not to draw back from what Rick has said, we've been doing this for a long time already. No, no. <laughs> okay, well, I'm picking that up. Um, uh, but I think the key task of all the white paper and the government is to determine a more appropriate and updated balance in our relations with the United States and China. On this fundamental question, uh, we will need to assess, frankly, so we need to assess frankly um, the extent to which the United States, although it will continue to be the major power in the world for the foreseeable future, uh, may be in relative decline, and how China itself is likely to evolve over the next decade. I think we should not be afraid of forward-looking change. For example, the ANZUS Treaty, which is treated by both sides of our politics as a sacred cow. Uh, it's now 60 years old, it's somewhat out of date, uh, and uh, should not be regarded as an absolute guarantee of American support, which it is not. Um, as I say, it should not be seen as a, a, a sacred cow. On the only occasion in which I can recall when we saw American support under ANZUS was during Indonesia's confrontation with Malaysia in 1964. The US United States declined and said, you got yourself in this problem, you get yourself out. So this is, uh, I'm just raising this to, to make the point that, uh, you know, we don't uh, have a, uh, an arrangement that can never be adjusted because it's been going on for a very long time. The other point I make, and a lot of Australians have made this to me, is that um, uh, despite all the virtues of the alliance of America, uh, shared values and things like that, uh, we have been led into three unsuccessful wars, Vietnam, Iran, and Afghanistan, in support of policy decisions shaped in Washington. Now, I think the white paper really must send an um, unambiguous signal to the Australian public and to China and the United States that while we have different approaches from China and an alliance relationship with the United States, we welcome the rise of China, see no intrinsic reason why China under its system of authoritarian capitalism, uh, which will China itself and then we need to make adjustments. Uh, cannot continue to rise peacefully. I think a failure to acknowledge a rise in China, if mismanaged, will lead to instability and frustrate progress.
towards Asia Pacific regional cooperation. It was very encouraging to hear from Professor Run the extent of the uh, contact that go on below the surface which we're between the United States and China, which we're not always uh, aware of. Um, I think we need to consult and talk with China uh, at the head of government level and ministerial levels on a regular basis. Uh, indeed, we should aim, we, of course it wouldn't be easy, but we should aim over a period of time to develop the sort of arrangements uh, approaching those we have developed with the United States, through which business leaders, political leaders, uh, can talk to their counterparts regularly by telephone and to stay in continuous contact. As I say, this will not be easy, but I think it should be one of the recommendations of the White Paper. Um, as a foundation member of the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue, um, I'm very conscious of the extent to which that dialogue has deepened the political engagement with the United States of Australian politicians on both sides of politics. Now, um, I think we still lack that depth of engagement with China and we need to work towards that uh, in the future. In saying this, I'll just repeat something which former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd once said to me. And, uh, I see it comes out at different times. Uh, um, it will be mentioned today that alliance does not equate to compliance and understanding does not necessarily equate to agreement. <coughs> now, as well as rebalancing our relations with China and the United States, we need to strengthen substantially our engagement with Indonesia, of course, Japan, um, and the main countries of ASEAN, other than Indonesia, which I'll refer to separately in a moment. Um, I think the White Paper should urge the government to ensure that uh, uh, Japan, is still the world's third largest economy, is emphasised, as is the growth of India. Um, and I'll just make a couple of quick comments on uh, what Australia sort of needs to uh, adjust its diplomatic style. I think we do need to build up a habit of regular consultation particularly with the main Asian countries, on a wide range of policy issues in advance of major decisions, especially those which affect them. Obvious recent example of our failure to do this with negative consequences was the decision subsequently rescinded to ban live cattle exports to Indonesia. Another was the announcement that we would establish a refugee asylum seeker regional centre in East Timor. Uh, after one telephone conversation in, in, uh, in Dili with the wrong person. Um, <clears throat> a third, I think, was the decision during President Obama's visit to rotate 2,500 US Marines through Darwin. Now, that is not that an important number. China probably has more than 2,500 police around the Tiananmen Square area. But it was the timing that was wrong and the message that it sent with that. Governments have to be more careful and more thoughtful about that. Australia needs to avoid any perception in Asian countries that racism and religious intolerance remain present in political and public attitudes. Because of our history, the white Australia policy and the statements of senior politicians uh, occasionally, we're on a sort of good behaviour bond in the eyes of many thinking Asians who remain uncertain about the depth and sincerity of our commitment to Asia, and indeed the Southwest Pacific. Um, and in this context, I mean, this may seem a strange comment to make, but I think in this context, issues like moving Australia moving out of the wheel of the West European and others group of the UN to the Asian group, severing our anachronistic links with the British Crown, these are not just symbolic. They're important indicators of the international image we should project on how we uh, see ourselves and our place in the world. References to Australia being part of the Anglosphere, uh, which still occur, uh, are uh, outdated, uh, except in terms of our uh, historical context, and unhelpful. 
In my experience, diplomatically, we tend to lecture too much and listen to Mr. Now, these were all points of style, which uh, we might have a male may or may not address. So just a few word, words about Indonesia. Uh, when I was in ambassador in Indonesia, it was described in a very good book as a nation in waiting. Well, Indonesia has evolved into a major nation in Asia. Uh, it is, of course, one of our four most important relationships. Um, and it's sad that the Australian community has uh, such in the board a bad understanding of what's actually going on in Indonesia. I won't repeat the uh, um, things I was going to say about languages and cultural studies because they have been covered. Um, <coughs> um, one point I'd make, I hope Simon won't, uh, Simon, if I wake you up for a minute, <laughs> I, well, I, I um, hope that um, you won't disagree with this. I think although ASEAN remains enormously important to Australia, um, when you're considering, when we're considering the, um, the, what's called the Asian century, the commercial centre of gravity has moved to North Asia some years ago at the rise of Japanese and South Korean economies, and now greatly enforced by the rise of China and India. I think the political and strategic sense of gravity has also moved somewhat to Northeast Asia with the problems of uh, North Korea and various unresolved territorial disputes. I think these are unresolved problems which the um, White Paper should try and, uh, uh, try and identify. Um, I've just heard the second gong, so I'll probably stop there with um, uh, just one final comment. But um, um, I've spent some time in Hong Kong recently at the opening of the Asian Society, and there were large American uh, and Chinese delegations there. And the discussions were very, very interesting. The message I took away was that while China uh, would resist American hegemony over the Asian Region. It welcomed the continuing and constructive United States involvement in Asia. Uh, it, China did not see uh, uh, itself as in any way a natural enemy of the United States, and hopefully vice versa. Um, and the, there was a general sort of agreement that uh, both countries, in fact, all the major countries in the region, did have a very important and shared. Um, need for stability and continued economic prosperity, particularly if you're going to go on lifting people out of poverty. Um, one um, very final comment, which really comes from a question I was asked during the lunch break, uh, as to um, whether I thought Australia was um, um, would be able to react to a, a good white paper, assuming the white paper it's full of good recommendations. And I think there is, as she expressed a concern, I think it's a real concern, that the opportunity could be missed if the government and the opposition continue to be enmeshed in a rather toxic political situation in which the consideration of big picture foreign policy issues are not, in, are not accorded the um, consider consideration that they should be. Now, that's uh, something for the future. Uh, in a strange way, uh, uh, you have a government which is sort of set in a particular policy, unchanged policy, um, and uh, uh, an incoming opposition government, in a strange way, might be better place to deal with this because new governments can always review policies. And, uh, uh, and indeed, so-called conservative or right-wing governments often deal more easily with Chinese governments, as you see from President Nixon's opening to China. Uh, the Republicans did uh, that, the Democrats couldn't have done it, they'd all be accused of communism. Uh, and I think in the same way, uh, concerned the Australian government will have opportunities, if it comes to power, to uh, uh, put a different focus on recommendations for the White Paper than they have been doing. But I better stop rambling on and stop there. So we need some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. <clears throat>
thank you to those uh, two speakers. Just to reprise them briefly, Dr. Wan uh, uh, made a point that we can afford in this part of the world to be more confident than some of us seem to be, uh, that the China-US rela relationship is actually busier, more intense than uh, sometimes we give uh, credit for, uh, that he thought uh, that China, that Australia could uh, handle uh, the China relationship better, that we have choices and can do better. Dick uh, made the point, of course, that uh, we're at a tipping point in policy terms. Uh, the terms uh, choosing between history and geography are now behind us. It is with our geography. We need a fundamental rebalancing of the relationship, he said, between China and the US. Uh, and like many of us, he very much hopes that the white paper uh, will uh, uh, point the way there. Uh, he made the final point indirectly. I'll re cast it in my words, if I may, Dick, that bipartisan support for this white paper is critical. Uh, I think that uh, well, almost whatever the white paper says, it'll be good, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, bipartisan support for that goodness is going to be necessary. Well, that leaves a clear 30 minutes for discussion. Could I just remind uh, discussants when they um, uh, stand uh, to speak, uh, could they please identify themselves for the most part uh, as Colin said earlier, those of us in the chamber know each other and we can see your name tags, but uh, our uh, friends at the back uh, will uh, certainly welcome you identifying yourself. Thank you. Richard, would you like to start? Uh, just a, a brief comment and a question relating to uh, Dr. Rahn's uh, excellent presentation. I'd agree that we can do better. We can always do better, and he gave some specific examples of where we might do that. Uh, but on the question of the rotation of Marines through Darwin, again, I'm, I'm one of those who certainly was not happy about the way it was announced or, or about the lack of consultation. That's irrespective of the, uh, uh, of the questions of the advisability or otherwise of having done it. But when I was in Beijing in early February this year and, and discussed this issue with a number of fairly senior people, uh, all I was hearing then was that we don't really care about 250 or 2,500 Marines in Darwin. After all, we've got far, far more, uh, far closer to home in Japan, in the Republic of Korea, in Guam. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is what sort of a signal are you in Australia trying to send to us? And I think that is a very valid question. I think it's something we didn't think through clearly. I don't think we think thought clearly through what sort of signal we're trying to send to Indonesia either. As Marty Natalikawa reminded us. But since that time, uh, particularly more recently, in the last month or so, I have seen uh, references at official level to uh, Chinese talking about this decision as actually being harmful to China's strategic interests. Now, that seems to me to be a, a notable. Uh, toughening, if you, if, if you like, a modification anyway, in, in, a, in, a, in a more harmless direction of, of China's position on this, on this issue. Um, and I'd like, if Mr. Rand could help, to know, has there been further thinking about this in, in, in China, um, thinking through and coming to rather tougher conclusions than usually, or uh, is this a misreading of uh, China's position? Richard, normally I'd say let's accumulate the questions, but in this case, let's ask uh, Dr. Ruan. I think it's a very important question. I'll give him the chance to respond immediately. Thanks, Richard. Well, thank you very much. A uh, very good question. And uh, I think you already answered uh, almost all, all this question. And uh, this morning's paper, the Financial Review, has an article, a very interesting article. Kirk Campbell, the US top officials, uh, diplomats mentioned about the United States has already admitted that this pivot to Asia has been has gone too far. You know, ha have you received this message? I think it's also very important that the U.S. Has, has done some so searching about it. So what what are those unintended consequences has been uh, delivered? Uh, there are some debates about this pivot to Asia. Uh, when I visit Washington early this month, my American friend told me they they try to abandon this place because it's terrible and misleading and ambiguity. So of course they say what would be the alternative? A kind of rebalance, so-called. 
were balanced. But I think the U.S. has already doing some review about how this policy has been uh, generated a sort of uh, elective result. So what I really tr try to link your question is, are those countries, for example, Australia, what are you are going to do if, if presumably the U.S. back off, let's say, from, that, from the previous uh, uh, move or adjustment? You know, I, I, it struck me that uh, the signal is a very crucial point. Uh, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, we don't care it's a 2,000 or several hundred thousand. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing. But the point is a message, as a signal. It happened against the contest of the South China Sea. This is why we perceive this question. Just because China, with Philippines, Vietnam, and other citizens has uh, some problems about the South China Sea, so it is already seems a kind of fire. I mean, the unintended consequences in this, the dark issue is to put some oil on this. So that's, for me, forgive me, that's my perspective about this issue. As a matter of fact, we don't care how much troops here. It's really, it, it's not a big deal. But you're right, absolutely right. But I don't think there's, uh, we have gone too far to interpret this, this thing. I think uh, we, we will stop there. That's OK. That's fine. And uh, of course, China, we attach great importance to our relationship with Australia. I think uh, we, we will have opportunity to exchange our view on that. Uh, uh, of course, we will try to get better understanding. That's very important. So here's the, one of the challenges for ch both China and Australia. Maybe for Australia, take it for granted, uh, something take it for granted. But you know, this is a very dynamic, ongoing, evolving world. We should keep our thinking, keep our uh, uh, research, keep our discussing to cope with this ongoing, very unsettling situation. This is also China's uh, uh, challenge as well. I don't think we have done perfectly a job. I guess China should have done a better job as well. And as a matter of fact, inside China, we have a lot of internal debate. The debate is, uh, has gone very far. I, I, I can bet you, assure you that. So that is a pretty good thing to, for us to contribute to, to the decision making. Because after all, it's pretty unsettling. And how should we? Uh, best equip ourselves with the correct or positive judgment to cope with the change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rowan. Mm -hmm. Dick, uh, would you like to comment? Yeah, I'd just uh, like to add a quick comment because I have a great time with Dr. Rowan said. I think one of the problems Australia faces or the government faces, it sort of locked itself into very early in the days of the uh, Labour government uh, into really uh, an unchanged, ongoing, uncritical <coughs> policy of which has been existing, existed under the umbrella of Andrews for many years. And we've gradually been incrementally strengthened and increased without much public, uh, much consultation with the public, let alone with other countries. And um, I was at the Obama dinner, and I have to say that I was uh, uh, <coughs> disappointed this uh, um, uh, sort of reiteration of the um, uh, of the what he called the pivot to Asia, because I was still hadn't retired when the, that phrase was sort of first used, and of course um, the pivot to Asia essentially re reinvigorates the old hub and spokes um, alliance. Uh, which was constructed by the United States during the Cold War. And I don't think that the idea of the pivot um, uh, was the right time to sort of reproduce that. Now, maybe I'm too old and the existing members of the government were unaware of the background of that. But the United States has always had a, uh, except for certain periods immediately after the Vietnam War, a very close involvement. Asia. And I think there's no need to uh, go back to the language, and I think we're not the 
go Australian government really needs to do is have much more nuanced and, <coughs> and very public diplomacy effort to get these uh, uh, more polished and uh, considered concepts out of the public. At the moment, the government is moving on spin. I, I'll just come to, I can answer part of your question, I think, Dr. Owen. What would uh, Australian Defence uh, uh, do if uh, uh, the US uh, rebalanced its rebalanced or abandoned its pivot notion? Uh, the answer is the, the American Marines would continue to come here because they desperately need that space to train in and that's what they're principally interested in. Um, the spin masters then made that into a big strategic call. But that's what it amounts to, and they'd go on doing it. Ambassador Nagami. Well, I have uh, a very short question to uh, Ambassador Walker and also the Professor Ruth. I was listening to your presentation very, uh, very with uh, great interest. Uh, the word rebalancing. Uh, the, the Americans are using that word too, the, uh, instead of. Uh, talking about pivot. Uh, the, uh, I think that they, they realized that the, 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 the word pivot was not really a, a, a good, good <coughs> But to a certain extent, I think that this uh, pivot concept is, well, I would say 10% spin, but 90% real. The, uh, as the uh, speaker mentioned, they need a facility for their Marines to upgrade their skills. They have been training, the, the Marines have been trained in Okinawa elsewhere for war on terror. But uh, they need now a space for Marines to be trained on conventional warfare. Uh, so uh, the, uh, this is a, a qualitative change uh, in American thinking. Uh, so uh, the moving from war on terror to more conventional warfares. I think that this includes a very important message. Um, the, my question uh, to Ambassador Walker is, rebalancing means the, what is your assessment on this uh, uh, extended deterrence? The uh, Australia, Japan, and ROK are the only countries only three countries in Asia to which this American extended deterrence is provided. And the, uh, so uh, when you sort of starting to rebalance, uh, you are talking about sort of more looser alliance relationship uh, or uh, the uh, uh, sort of not ad hoc but the case by case cooperation or coalition or uh, the uh, uh, in, in our thinking alliance policy is rather comprehensive and inclusive. And so how, how you can't have a sort of pick and choose when you have a you know, sort of strong alliance relationship. How are you going to reconcile this, uh, that one thing? <coughs> and my question to Mr. 2,500, you know, we don't care and all these things, fine. Do you care about the 55,000 troops presenting in the Archipelago, Japanese Archipelago. This is a very strong deterrence power. So, uh, the, uh, and another point, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the way it is presented uh, in the Australian Parliament and all that, that is you know, none of my concern. Uh, but uh, in some uh, quarters in China, I think there are lots of debates going on in China, China the, uh, uh, this pivot, and also the uh, deployment or uh, training uh, in Darwin is a part of containment. Uh, many, some, some, some ex-admirals uh, no, uh, or the current, uh, present, you know, the, uh, the, the incumbent admirals uh, keep writing all these articles on global daily and all these things about the potential element of containment in this uh, U.S. Uh, strategy. Well, Thank you, uh, Ambassador Nagami. Dick, there was a question very specifically to you there. Would you like to take it, or would you like to hear some other questions first? Or? I'll take it now. Okay, yes, fine. 
Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting statement and, and I think a very good question. I've always thought that uh, uh, a big problem for Australia is maintaining an independent foreign policy within the framework of the alliance. Now, uh, we have done that in the past and we can do it. And I don't think that, uh, uh, I don't draw too much on personal experience, but I've visited the United States and I was four Australian Prime Ministers, two from each side of politics. And I find that the ones who do the best are those who are open, frank, because the Americans in the end, they obviously want to be agreed with, but if there's a, a difference they would, otherwise they tend to take it for granted if you don't uh, uh, put, so if you don't agree, uh, it's better to say so. But uh, you say it's hard to pick and choose, and it's your phrase, and how do you reconcile this? It's not difficult, but I think it has been done. There have been a number of areas where we've not uh, always agreed with the United States. The uh, biggest example, I think, was probably the um, uh, American invasion of Jamaica, where we voted against the United States. Uh, no. no, sorry, it's Jamaica. Ken Cricket mixed up with me. Sorry. No. <laughs> Jamaica's never been invaded, as far as I know. Anyway, that was that particular question. And uh, on the issue of the numbers, uh, I just mentioned that we've had some, I think over the years, nearly 6,000 Singaporeans, 6,000 Singaporeans have trained in Australia. That's, uh, yeah, we provide those sort of facilities. I agree with what uh, um, Professor Quan said. That it's it's not the um, the number; it's the uh, message it sent, and the time that message was sent. Sending that message on the eve of the Bali summit uh, was a dreadful mis diplomatic mistake, I was very as far as, and considerably upset President Yudhoyono. Of course, we had to meet Gillard, Prime Minister Gillard, two days after. Thanks, uh, Dick. Uh, uh, Richard Bronowski, you had a question. Yeah, Dick. Thanks, uh, Dick. I, I'd like to comment that um, this pivot we're talking about is a pretty broad pivot. Yes, uh, the United States wants the space, the uh, spatial, both the air and the, the ground space in, in Darwin to exercise. That's true. But what do we make, Dr. Ruan, of the fact that the United States Defence Secretary has recently been in Vietnam, talking about, for goodness sake, reviving some of the bases like Cameron Bay. I remember being there during the war, the Vietnam War, and it seemed the last thing that would possibly happen in my lifetime, but it looks like it might occur again. The fact that uh, Clark and Subic Bay in, in, uh, in the Philippines might also become bases. The fact that the ties seem to be looking quite interestingly, at the possibility of opening some of their air base facilities to Americans. This surely must strike you and China and Beijing as uh, going further with containment. And my second point to you, Dr. Run, is we can talk about military diplomacy, and it seems to me one, one definition of military diplomacy is where suddenly the Australian Navy proudly announces that it's going to have joint military naval exercises with the Chinese Navy. We have frigates going up the Yangtze. We have, and that's not gunboat diplomacy, that's, that's uh, another kind of diplomacy. So do you think this attenuates or ameliorates the thoughts in Beijing that, you know, we're being contained? I think containment is a real policy, but does this to some extent moderate? And do you think that perhaps in China more could be made of uh, military collaboration with countries in the region? Dr. Ruan, thank you. Thank you very much. A couple of questions. And, uh, one way or others are related, so let me, let me do it this way. Uh, first, in response to uh, Mr. Nagami, thank you for your uh, questions. Um, well, as I have, have said, the, one of the, the showcase how China and the United States interact globally, as a matter of fact, locates in Asia. So this is a permanent or fundamentally important how China and the United States accommodates with each other. 
As a matter of fact, as I mentioned, that we have the Asia Pacific Affairs Consultation. That is a part of the efforts to deal with this issue. We both recognize if we don't handle well, that will become a bigger problem. So the two government, two side policymakers that come together. So that suggests that each side is pretty clear and concerns what will be the unintended consequences if we fail to act properly. Um, let me make it clear, and China, I don't think China has any intention or capability to drive the United States out of Asia. Not at all, I, I don't believe it. I, as a matter of fact, we welcome US presence in Asia. Of course, we hope it uh, can play a more constructive role. So, uh, at all. And you know, in 1992, uh, who drove US out of Asia? That's the Philippines. The closest, uh, the military base, it's the allies. It's like China, we can't do nothing about it, really, even if we don't like it. So we have to recognize there's no intention whatsoever China will challenge American supremacy here. Of course, the number two is always not so easy, right? Because the number one always dubious of so what you're going to do when you grow bigger. But so this is a kind, kind of a trust building efforts for both uh, the governments. So this type of the new notion of new type of major power relationship is also an integral part of the latest efforts to build the trust. And we do want to cha uh, challenge What's the good for us? China has benefited enormously from the world system in the last 30 years. And we strongly believe there is even more space, more room for China. So what's the point for us to overthrow all of a sudden this system? We are pretty happy. Of course, it is not perfect. So that's why China joined WTO, want to make some contribution and with other developing countries to make this system more fair and more reasonable. So after all, we're not the Soviet Union. Soviet Union wants to throw out the old system and create its own. So this is not China's choice. And uh, more basically about the containment issue, so you, you point out. Uh, Ambassador mentioned about global times. You know, sometimes we have a private conversation when global time is kind of like a Fox News in the United States, you know? <laughs> it's very different. It's a, it's a phenomenon, right? But I don't think it represents the mainstream of the policy makers. So I don't think the policy makers view that the U.S. is trying to contain China. No way. The U.S. cannot contain China anymore. And it's too little, too late. But of course, having said this, it does not mean U.S. is feel pretty comfortable about China. Sometimes it feel uncertain about China's way forward. So it pursue at the best a kind of policy of hedge. That is to say, on one hand, pretty strong engagement with China, as we have said, it people to people relationship. And economic ties last year, 2011, the two-way two trade is over 440,000 40, US dollars. So, so it's also booming. And many other network consultations. So this is a kind of engage. But in the same time, the US also they have, have to do some uh, preparation for the worst case. This is a policy makers has been doing. So, I don't think the U.S. can deliver its containment. After all, I don't think U.S. partners, even allies, they want to be part of this containment grant strategy. I don't think, I don't think this is going to be true. Surely that's my, my view there. Uh, so if you say, yes, there are some people in China, they are talking about the containment. For sure, China has become more diversified, more voices. I think that this is for some time that the U.S. and others say urge China to, you, you, you must speak, oh, you don't have to speak in one voice. Sometimes for too long, the West complained China has been speaking in one voice. But now you got it. We got different voices. 
So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> and it might become true. So now you, you, you say, well, oh, so many words, which one represents the main strength and which? Try lesson two. So it's your problem. It's not <laughs> our problem. You know, it's a, like the American says, uh, our currency, but your problem. So I think we'd better prepare, better prepare ourselves for a more diversified, more onward transforming China. Thank you. Thank you. I've just uh, exercised the moderator's privilege to make two points here. One is on the matter of the Marines, uh, I agree, not a military strategic uh, concern at all uh, uh, for China. After all, anyway, tens of thousands of American soldiers train here every year and have done for decades uh, and will continue to do whatever happens in Darwin. Uh, the message I got from Chinese friends was what that decision uh, said about the extent to which Australian policy is beholden to the US and what that might mean uh, uh, separately uh, further uh, down the track. And the answer, of course, in part is the less you spend on your own defence, the more beholden you become to someone else. And that could be a risk. A second point I make about the containment is that part of the problem there is that word had a very particular meaning in regard to the Soviet Union. And anything remotely like that is not possible. Uh, with China in this uh, greatly interdependent world that we've talked about already. The world is already so open to China and China to the world that that is past. So the word containment is very hard to uh, draft out of history and use in, in those uh, terms, uh, quite apart from its inappropriateness in policy terms. Let's move on. More discussion? Who'd like to make uh, any further points there? Yes? Gentleman at the back. I'm sorry I don't recognise you. That's all right. Uh, Cameron Bruce, AWA, New South Wales. Yes. Um, Mr Walcott, you brought up this idea of Australia having the possibility of being an interlocutor between the US and China. Um, and this is an idea that's come up um, from, from other areas as well. I'm interested in your thoughts. Perhaps you could elaborate on spe some specifics in that regard. What kind of areas do you see specifically Australia having a role in this kind of brokerage role between the US and perhaps Dr. Rowan, you could offer your thoughts as well. Um, Dick, that was attributed to you, that idea of interlocutor. I thought it was more from Dr. Rowan, but uh, you have some experience of the notion anyway. Just make a very brief comment. I think that uh, diplomatically, of course, Australia can play a role in trying to influence uh, United States policy uh, as an ally and also uh, Chinese policy. We shouldn't overstate our influence. I mean, China and the United States are great powers. They can work out their own problems without uh, us helping them solve. Uh, so I think that's the, uh, the issue. We don't really have that role. I, I don't think I have ever suggested that we. Uh, I think it was. You know, Dr. Rowan, would you like to elaborate on that? I think you did make that suggestion. Sorry, I missed that. We're, we're humbled by your suggestion that we might be some inter, sort of interlocutor between uh, China and the US. Yeah, well, th that is uh, strengthening my personal feeling that uh, that's all Australia can play a part. Uh, let me share one of my observ observations when I was in Melbourne two, years, uh, two days ago. Uh, this, was my, this is my first trip to Australia, to be very frank. So Good. Everything is, uh, Great. It's new to me, so I, I very much appreciate your invitation for this. And in Melbourne, people, when people talk about the footing, they told me a lot about yes. the Australian rule. Oh, I really don't know what is the Australian rule. <laughs> so I'm, actually, I'm here pretty humble to learn what you guys really mean that. I, I know the city that they will say, oh, it's a... You don't play a lot of footy, right? Rugby Union or Rugby League is a favorite sports here. But you know, a kind of rivalry between Sydney and uh, Melbourne, I, I understand. So my, my, my friends told me when I, he sent me to the airport, he said, please told you a city friend, Melbourne reminds me the best. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to jump into it to interfere in your internal affairs. <laughs> but what I'd like to say here actually is that, um, I think Australia is a pretty unique, pretty unique. You have the heritage of the Europe, wisdom, culture, and the society network, all this stuff. But you are also located in somewhere else pretty close to Asia. 
So this is your advantage. Why am I going to take it? And China, for example, our relationship has been tremendously uh, developed in the recent years. And I don't see any kind of reason to slow down. So that's why I, I'm personally very positive about this uh, white paper effort. As I said, uh, to you, you are pretty conscious. Try to shape the Australia's, the, the, the society, to tell the society what will be the, the position of Australia, what are you going to do? So I think this is the right thing to do. You already done this very smart thing. I, I really cannot add any more. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Rahman. You're, you're very welcome here, and I hope you do come to understand Australian rules. Uh, uh, Cameron, let me just uh, try to answer your uh, question. Uh, I don't think there's any room for an interlocutor between the two. There's room for an interlocutor who talks frankly to both. Uh, but uh, uh, an interlocutor between the two would be presumptuous. We have room for one question. Jeff. Thank you. I'd just like to make a minor comment. That is that, uh, Jeff Miller, this is sorry, you have something. Or Sydney. It's more, it's more, it's easier for them to do that than ever before. And so I think we have to bear that aspect in mind as well as, as, well as uh, geography. Thanks, Jeff. The point where Professor Tay would like to make a, a final point, and we welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to get your attention earlier. Sorry. Um, to respond to Dick Walker as well as to some comments about some of the ASEAN countries, um, I think that this discussion, as I've been listening to it, has been very fascinating with China, as many of us are. But the question I always come to is, even if you see something that fascinates you, how do you deal with it? And I think these are separate questions. Uh, as I said in my own remarks, if Australia feels that it's big enough and has enough heft to deal with China directly, that's fine. But there are so many places in play, so I just wanted to explain what I think ASEAN is trying to do. A number of the ASEAN countries, of course, have for their own reasons sought to paint the American pivot as being very militaristic. And so I've tried to pull them in. And I think this is what Kurt and others have been uh, responding to, to, to nuance their own pivot. Uh, and so even when uh, uh, Clinton came down this time around, she was trying to bring up the economic and other issues. Mm. Mm. So I would say that they've been trying their best, the Clinton and Campbell team, to really, across Asia, do much more than just purely military. Uh, but it is the interest of Vietnam and the Philippines to paint that element up. Mm -hmm. And frankly, in some American eyes, it's the easiest element to paint up since they have strengths there, whereas for various reasons, their economic and other uh, playroom is much more limited. Um, mm. Dick made the point, of course, that Northeast Asia is where the huge economies are. That's correct. But I think that uh, the hub of Southeast Asia is something that the Americans have been paying much more attention to in this so-called pivot. The ASEAN summits, the Lower and Mekong Initiative, and others have really become a way the Americans try to deal with the others in Asia, even if their own concern is with China. And so in that sense, I do not think that even if our concern is with China, we should ignore the others in what is hopefully Asian, not merely a Chinese century. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. It's a very 
tidy way to conclude, I do agree that uh, rebalance means much more than just military, and that is an important message to have uh, gotten across. That uh, concludes our session. I do have one announcement. John uh, tells me that someone left uh, his or her glasses as in spectacles in the Jubilee room. John is available, available to lead you to the room to find them, should you wish that. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much, Dr. Oan and Dick, uh, for uh, uh, leading us into a terrific discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to be moderating this final session for the day, um, focusing on education, culture, and society um, within the broader framework of our debate around Australia's future in the Asian century. My name is Jenny Lang. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor International at the University of New South Wales. And from the university's perspective, um, we're delighted to have this conversation and to be providing input into a white paper that does take such a long-term view of the world. Um, engagement with Asia is not new to our universities. In fact, um, at our university, we're celebrating 60 years of strategic and comprehensive engagement with Asia this year. And that has brought all sorts of wonderful opportunities for UNSW, but more importantly, has connected us strategically into many countries across the Asian region, both emerging superpowers, but also the middle powers in Asia that are also incredibly important, and our ver very near neighbours. Um, and there are continued opportunities for us to really work in a strategic way in partnership with government, with business and industry, um, and also with the region to ensure that we're doing everything we can to position our future graduates to be able to engage in effectively with cultural literacy skills, um, a strong awareness of the diversity across Asia and within countries within Asia, and also to understand the power of people-to-people -people links and increasingly the power of important networks. This, after so this afternoon's session is really important because um, if we were having a discussion like this in um, the Asian context, education would be one of the key items at the front of the agenda, um, as there is a strong emphasis across the region of forming plans that span 20 to 25 years when it comes to education and culture and society. And I think that's something that we can really learn from the Asian region, that the investment in education, research and development, the um, human capital resources, the intellectual capital that really is the engine room behind those um, emerging economies and um, developed economies is so important. And so it's wonderful to still see that we have probably 80% of participants in the room. Um, it's an issue that um, brings people with passion around education and culture together. And I think it's very, very important that we elevate the status of education when it comes to our bilateral and multilateral links um, with and across the Asian region. Just like to note that the universities have many strategic institutes at work. Um, I think one of the great um, frameworks that has been put in in recent years has been the Australia India Strategic Research Fund that's brought researchers and people together around common issues. But the great thing about the frameworks when they go in and they're negotiated in the education space is that they are for mutual benefit and they do build on um, synergies, complementarity, and both sides work together to ensure that we are able to create impact that benefits our societies. This afternoon, we have two wonderful speakers who are going to um, speak for 10 minutes each. The aim of this session is that those um, presentations will trigger ideas and comments and input from clearly people who are so passionate about this topic um, here this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the afternoon, 
um, His Excellency Mr Biran Nanda, who is the High Commissioner of India in Australia and has joined us this year, um, is a graduate of one of our great partner universities, the University of Delhi in Economics. And in 1978, Mr Nanda joined the Indian Foreign Service. Um, he has represented his country as a diplomat in Singapore, Beijing, Shanghai, Washington and Tokyo. Um, and has also served in um, um, Indonesia. Um, and we're delighted to have um, Mr Nanda with us today. India is very, very important, particularly in the higher education context, and we welcome your input, Your Excellency. Thank, thank you, Chair. It's an honour for me to be invited to participate in the AIIA National President's Forum on Australia and the Asian Century. As Asian economies grow, the global situation presents a mixed picture. On one hand, Emerging Asian economies are growing at a healthy pace, increasing their share in global trade and output. On the other hand, many obstacles have to be overcome if they are to sustain their rapid growth in the decades ahead. Particularly important are the supply side constraints of the Asian economy's narrative of catch-up growth, including energy, water, food, infrastructure, and not in the least, education and skills training. There is much that Asian economies can gain from interaction and exchanges with other societies in terms of best practices, improved capabilities, and the additionality of resources. There are three important uh, areas of partnership between Asian economies and Australia. Australia, I think it is well known, has been a big beneficiary of the demand for tertiary education and vocational education from emerging economies from Asia. In tertiary education alone, Australia earned a revenue of more than $16 billion last year. This demand for education is likely to grow exponentially over the next few decades. Opportunities for Australian partnership in the tertiary education sector in Asian countries will also improve over time. To give a sense of the networks that have been established in the tertiary sector, based on a 2012 survey of universities in Australia, it was re revealed that there are 179 formal agreements between Indian and Australian universities as of May 2012. Of these, 172 are currently active. They involve student and staff exchanges and research collaboration. Five Australian universities deliver 15 programs in India. Second is the area of skills training. Like other emerging economies, India faces a large requirement of vocational education training over the next few decades. 12 million people enter the workforce in India every year. Our domestic institutional training capacities are insufficient for this monumental task. Skills training and vocational education therefore presents a huge opportunity for Australia to leverage and benefit from Asian growth in the coming decades. It's also a win-win opportunity for Australia's Asian partners as the, they seek to overcome capacity constraints in this area. The third area is of course science and technology collaboration which Chil the Chairman alluded to. As emerging economies in Asia, we have enhanced our capacity and contribution to the developing development of science and technology and collaboration and joint activities in research and development are acquiring a new salience in Australia's partnership with Asian countries. The products of this collaboration have great potential benefits for Australia and our Asian partners. India and Australia have a very successful st strategic fund for science and technology research, which was established in 2006, in which there has been collaboration in the areas of agricultural research, astronomy, astrophysics, environmental science, microelectronics, nanotechnology, renewable energy, marine sciences, and earth system sciences. Many, many of these research projects have had a direct uh, impact on and benefit in areas like food and energy security, agriculture, etc. 
what can be done to facilitate this partnership or these educational, cultural and social links between India and Australia. And here I make comments relevant to both Australia as well as Australia's Asian partners. Higher education institutions have a key role to play in developing awareness about the region. Universities in Asia and Australia need to devote an adequate amount of resources to area studies in history, economics, politics, culture and society of nations in the region. Area studies will provide an oppor opportunity for fruitful collaboration between specialists from different branches of study. They will help better understand the dynamics of relations between Asian countries and Australia, which take place at many levels, economic, financial, monetary, demographic, cultural, ranging from reciprocal influence in art and culture to commercial dealings in the export of products, sales of patent, and tourist travel. Second, the issue of language learning, which was referred to earlier, also needs to be addressed. Learning an Asian language could open up a whole new culture and create a unique platform for communication and understanding and the pursuit of individual community and national goals. Even in Asian countries where English is widely spoken, it is important to reflect and understand that familiarity with the English language often makes us complacent and comfortable in the false knowledge that we know everything about each other. Asia is a unique region where many rivers of civilization have come together to form a rich and beautiful confluence of cultures. Culturally, the Asian century is symbolized by Bollywood, Hong Kong Kung Fu movies, Japanese animation, and the Korean wave. Feng Shui books, top bestseller lists, and corporations hire Feng Shui and Vastu consultants to advise them on the layout of their offices. Clearly, the interface of Asian and non-Asian cultures needs a new stress on intercultural studies in order to ensure better communication and understanding. Growing people-to-people -people links are an indip indispensable aspect of globalization and regional integration in the region. We must encourage the expansion of tourism between Australia and Asian countries. Better communication links, including direct flights, will certainly be part of the answer. Sporting and cultural events can stimulate tourist traffic. Asian countries and Australia will have to focus on marketing each other in a more effective manner. Australia and our Asian neighbors have a unique opportunity to be partners in progress in the Asian century, provided they equip themselves with the awareness, the knowledge, and the tools that would enable them to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we will um, turn to our second speaker, um, Dr. Alison Bronowski, um, who is a former diplomat, um, has written and edited nine books, um, and works very closely with four universities in um, New South Wales and the ACT, the ANU, UNSW, the University of Wollongong and Macquarie University. Um, Alison has spent 30 years focusing on East Asia regionalism and the idea of an Asian Renaissance and this has certainly been a major priority um, of her academic work but drawing on a rich history of living and working and representing our country around the world but particularly across the Asian region and the Middle East. Um, would you join me now in welcoming Dr Bronowski who will speak for the next 10 minutes. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you to all of you who have stayed to the very last for this. Um, let's hope that it's, if you carry this away with you, um, you will have lost nothing. Um, the idea of an Asian century is not new. And when Ken Henry's white paper was announced, I thought, oh, we're already 12 years into the 21st century. And the idea of an Asian century was first dreamed up by people in India and Japan in the late 1890s, anticipating the 20th century. 
I thought, well, what does this reveal about our ignorance for a start? It is a real worry. And so I winced a bit. And then I thought, no, we'll have to do this. It's a re-education campaign just to bring us up to speed and to make up, perhaps, for the century that we have almost wasted. In the mid-20th century, Bertrand Russell anticipated what an Asian century would mean when he wrote, I think if we are to feel at home in the world, we shall have to admit Asia to equality in our thoughts, not only politically but culturally. What changes this will bring about, I do not know, but I'm convinced that they will be profound and of the greatest importance. And this he wrote in 1946. It's incredible how little notice we have taken of what has gone before. In the late 1800s, a Japanese scholar, Fukuzawa Yukichi, went around the world. He missed Australia, but he came back with a message for Japanese to say, we have to drop all this Asian stuff and we have to westernise immediately. What he called upon them for was a fundamental cultural change. Can you imagine the drama of it? They had all been brought up on Chinese learning. All of their government structures, their law, everything, was based upon what Japan had imported from China. There had been little bits from Europe, but it had not been part of the official uh, setup in, in any way. And what Fukuzawa Yukichi and his colleagues, and by the way, he went on to found Keio University, what he and his colleagues achieved was a fundamental turnaround in the way Japanese looked at the world. They sent Japanese out to the world to find out how the best practice uh, was done in various other countries and bring it back. And they brought in foreign experts from the rest of the world to help them to implement it. Just imagine if we did that. What Ken Henry has called for in his original paper uh, that set out the call for a, a, a white paper on this subject was a fundamental change in the way Australia views the world. I don't think he had anything like that in mind. But just imagine if we did it. It has taken Australia, as I said, tw until now, 12 years into the 21st century to see what has for so long been obvious to, about our region, to people who live in it, and to respond to that. I mean, not only did the Japanese and the Indians talk about this at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, but it was picked up by Malaysians, Singaporeans, and, uh, uh, and Indonesians in the second half of the 20th century. And Anwar Ibrahim, you'll remember, in 1986 wrote a book called The Asian Renaissance, which was then followed by his colleagues in Singapore picking up on the same idea. And there was a conference for a new Asian century in 1994 sponsored by Mahathir, which had one Australian delegate at it, <coughs> Stephen Fitzgerald. These things were all happening under our nose, and nobody saw what it meant for Australia. Now, I hope that there will be a major change, perhaps not of... Fukuzawa-type um, proportions, but I hope that there'll be a major change that will come out of Ken Henry's report. It will, and here's my list of things I hope, it will make Australia more interesting, relevant, and useful in the Asian region than we have ever been. And it will earn Australia a reputation as the world's best informed country on everything to do with Asia. That's the aim that I would hope a Ken Henry white paper would endorse. Now those strategies, the, those, those, that wish list comes with a, a list of strategies and they involve culture, society and education, just as I've been asked to do. Plus a concentration, a real concentration on Asia itself. First, society. In this so-called uh, ideal Asian century, here's what will happen. Australia will come to reflect and resemble Asian societies more than ever before. 
enabling us to identify more closely with our region and to be more readily accepted in it. As the Asian proportion of our population rises, Australia's Western self-identification will gradually weaken. And with that should come a better understanding of our place in the hierarchy of Asian societies. We should aim to join with Asian groups in every relevant international organisation, including the United Nations, and remembering always that membership of such groups is for the members to bestow not for, and for Australia to achieve, not for us to declare. Secondly, culture. Settler Australia's ideas and traditions were largely imported from the West, of course, and they remained, we were stuck, I think, with a highly derivative cringe <coughs> culture until well into the early 1970s. And the projection of our culture into Asian societies was not as enthusiastically taken up then or since as it should have been. Australia's image and identity have changed, but not fast enough, I think, for, uh, nor with enough conviction, really, to displace an enduring reputation that we have in South Asian countries as a cultural desert, in North Asian countries as third-rate Western, and in Southeast Asian countries as racist, overbearing, and uncouth. Indigenous culture, in the view of many people in the region, is all that makes Australian culture distinctive. If we're going to change such entrenched views, we'll have to work not only on changing those perceptions, but also on changing the reality. A new national narrative will emerge as more Australians develop a confident interaction with cultures in the region. Third, education. In an Asian century, Australia will respect education as people in Asian countries do, elevating teaching to a highly regarded and well-paid profession, and stop expecting foreign students entirely to fund our university system. If Australians expect Asians to study here, in the Asian century, Australians will equally be expected to study in Asian countries. A reverse Colombo plan, which has been mooted, will put Australia not just on receive, as we've been used to for the last 60 years, but on send as well. We'll derive the same benefits from what students bring back from studying in the region as generations of Asian students have done from studying in Australia. We have never sufficiently appreciated either the capacity of Asia literate Australians. And in an Asian century, we will put their experience and knowledge, that is to say, the 30% uh, Asian-born Australians, to better use in education, government, industry, business, the media, and in the professions. Studies of Australia are an important vehicle for, oh, by the way, I should say that what Jenny McGregor had to say about Asian Link and using Asian capacities in Australia is very heartening to me, and I didn't know about it until today. Studies of Australia are an important vehicle for projection in Asian countries, and equally, support for studies of Asia in Australia will not, in an Asian century, be turned on and off at political will. Language, of course, as we've heard from many people, is central. After English, Chinese languages are the most spoken in Australia, yet very few non-Chinese Australians now study Mandarin. Japanese and Korean and Indonesian are endangered languages not only in Australia, by the way, but in the view of some, in their own countries too. So there's considerable effort being put into sustaining and promoting those languages in, in Japan, in Korea, and uh, elsewhere, where there are languages that will otherwise fall victim to the universalization of English. We can learn a lot from how that's being done. In an Asian century, language will be compulsory in schools, and we will develop Korean, Thai, Hindi, Bahasa Malaysia, and more in our universities, or redevelop them, shall I say. The recommended national curriculum will end the history versus geography debate, and fortunately I understand it's going to do that, by introducing world history for secondary students that will include, as an equal part of everything else, perspectives on 
uh, Asian histories, uh, the, the histories of our Asian neighboring countries. Finally, a decision by Australia to relate more closely and peacefully with our region and to consult as fully with our neighbors as we do with the United States is a wonderful thought for an Asian century. My fear is that it will not be compatible with what comes out in the forthcoming uh, defense white paper. If the white paper continues to imply, that is to say the defense white paper, continues to imply the unquestioning compliance with United States wishes that we have shown in, for instance, basing Marines in Darwin and in Cocos Islands, which is even more alarming, and in invading Afghanistan and Iraq at US wishes, then the kind of Asian century strategies that I'm talking about will find themselves in direct collision with such a white paper. And I have a feeling that the reason that this white paper is delayed is not only because it's too long and needs to be edited a bit, but because it has raised in the minds of the writers and perhaps of ministers too, a fundamental question that challenges Australia right now. In other words, perhaps unknowingly, our government has posed itself and all of us the key question that needs to absorb us right now. What are we? Are we fish or fowl? As the Chinese say, are we a bat or a bird? Which foot do we kick with? Are we an Asian country or are we part of an Asia-Pacific alliance? Now, I'm not saying that anybody abandons an alliance. You keep all the tools that you have to use in your diplomacy when you need them. But our emphasis needs the kind of radical change that I have suggested the Japanese made over 100 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bronowski, and also High Commissioner Nanda for some very interesting perspectives. And I think um, um, from the point of view of High Commissioner Nanda, um, the importance of partnerships and understanding the complexity of um, the um, Asian region and the opportunities that that complexity brings and, um, and the way in which we can all benefit from strategic collaboration at the bilateral and multilateral level. And then across to Dr. Bronowski's rethinking um, who we are and, and our place in this region in light of developments and, um, and the way in which the Asian region is coming into prominence in this century. I think we also have been given some warnings um, that we are 12 years into the century um, and if we are to have future graduates of our education systems with the literacy and the ability to engage, we're looking at well into the 2030s. So I'm going to open the floor now to input and comments because it's an important topic and I'm sure there are lots of people here who have got um, input that they would like to make um, to this important session. When you do um, ask a question or make a comment, can you please let us know who you are and where you are from? Jenny. Um, Jenny, I just wanted to pick up on um, Alison's point about the school curriculum and just to um, let people know that there is a massive amount of work being done on the new for the first time in our nation's history, national school curriculum, which is really exciting in that there are the um, powers that be in education have decreed that there will be three across curriculum perspectives. One is Indigenous, one is Environment and one is Asia. So that really is leading an enormous amount of work in reframing our curriculum, um, reconfiguring and rethinking and reimagining what our teachers are going to learn and we're all very hopeful that as of 2013 in most states and 2014 in uh, New South Wales, 
that there will be um, a new way of approaching our education, um, not to throw out, for fear that Christopher Pine gets terribly upset, the um, Western tradition, but merely to balance our education system so that we pay equal attention to the Eastern tradition as the Western. Thank you. Tam Blaine. Australia Time Business Council and Beasley Intercultural. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Bronowski for the points she raised. I think this is something that's been forgotten somewhat. I think it's easy to oversimplify the Australia in the Asian century conversation about the size of economies and business engagement. And I think what we find in working in building Asian workforce capability in our work is that this is about change and it's about complexity and it's about identity. And when you start to explore those issues, that raises the related issues of fear, anxiety, and I think what the review is bringing up are a lot of deeper issues that are going to keep coming up about who we are as Australia and how we belong and participate in this region. So I think this is something that we need to be prepared for as well, the people in this room and our organisations and our institutions, when this conversation becomes larger in the public mind. Because I think sometimes it's very easy for all of us who work in this space to keep talking to like people, and we all nod and say, yes, 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 Asia is very important, we know that. But in much of the Australian population, people are still nervous. And so I think these issues of identity are actually really critical. And I think change theory can sometimes help us understand what's going on. You know, your classic change models, you need awareness, design, knowledge, ability and reinforcement. It's not enough to just say it's a logical, rational thing to engage with Asia, because we're not necessarily rational beings. So I think, thank you for bringing that up. And I think it's a very critical point. Thank you. Yes. Comment. My name is Brett Elliott. Uh, I'm a freelance consultant. Um, arigato. Uh, um, I grew up in the Asia Pacific. Um, I saw the overthrow of Chandrawan and the presence of Reagan in uh, Korea. Um, I grew up in Thailand and saw the modernisation of <coughs> Bangkok as a world city. I lived in Hong Kong for six years and saw the Hong Kong handover. And I lived in Indonesia for uh, the overthrow of Suharto. And um, I came back to Australia in 2003 to have a baby and experienced um, incredible reverse culture shock. I kind of felt like a part of Asia. I kind of felt Asian because I grew up overseas. And, um, came back to Australia thinking that Australians were boisterous, bold, um, entrepreneurial and enterprising people. And um, as in the way that we settled our country, in the way we conduct ourselves overseas, we came back to Australia to find us uh, risk averse, um, laden with rules and bureaucracy and uh, fear based in the way that we approach change and development and enterprise in our region. Uh, we talk about being green, but you know China already has 10% renewables with a target of 15% by 2020. And uh, I think we really need to have a, a good hard look at ourselves because I don't feel that the way our government represents us publicly, the true representation of who Australians are as people. And I think we can do much better in being bold and enterprising and uh, less concerned with being uh, over-educated and clever. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just uh, invite any sorts of initiatives and support any sorts of initiatives to really drive change in a dynamic way. Thank you. Rory. Thanks, uh, Jenny. Rory Medcalf uh, from the Lowy Institute and the University of New South Wales. I um, wanted to offer two comments on the, I guess, the education, culture and society topic of this afternoon. And, and I guess introduce that with a thought about the day more generally. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting in on the morning session. I missed the, the previous session, so excuse me if I'm reinventing the wheel. <coughs> um, I do think uh, I would, I would emphasise that our definition of Asia in all of this conversation has to be 
quite broad. Um, I know there are differing, differing debates about terminology, Asia-Pacific, um, Asia and so forth. Um, I would strongly suggest that we adopt uh, what I would call an Indo-Pacific definition of Asia. That is uh, a definition of Asia that certainly includes uh, India and much of South Asia in the Asia that matters to Australia uh, economically, culturally, uh, strategically as, as well. And I certainly accept also that our definition has to still reach across the Pacific because I think the future of America in Asia is, um, is, is far from settled and I certainly would agree with those that don't see America as being in, in, in terminal decline in Asia. But on the issue of culture and society, um, I think the good news is that a lot of the, the positive change about really... Oh, I, sh I should add that an Indo-Pacific definition of Asia would automatically define Australia as Asian, and that's, I think, uh, a point that's worth bearing in mind because we are an Indo-Pacific nation. But on culture and society and education, I think the good news is that change is happening in Australia. Um, I was very struck a few years ago watching, I think, an Anzac Day march in, here in Sydney uh, when a number of schools have begun taking part in uh, Anzac Day marches. And uh, I think it was um, James Roos uh, Agricultural High School, if I recall rightly, had with a, a really excellent brass band, frankly, putting to shame a few of the, um, the military bands um, uh, performing that day. Uh, and I couldn't help but notice the, um, the ethnic origin of, of uh, many of the students. Um, uh, the, the, it was a, a very strong uh, contingent, I guess, of, of Chinese, young Chinese Australians and a very strong contingent of young Indian Australians. And I thought, imagine these kids 20, 30 years into the future. They are going to be, um, I hope a few of them will be sitting in this, in this chamber, uh, but I think uh, that they are going to be uh, young leaders in our society. Uh, this, and, and yet they were, I think, with great sincerity, uh, uh, really uh, adopting uh, what you would have to say is, a, is an Australian cultural tradition of something that many many foreigners still find, find baffling. So I'm very hopeful about, I guess, the, um, the increasingly Asian nature of Australian society looking forward. But there's going to be a lot of, I think, friction and difficulty on the way there. I think we're, we're at risk of underestimating the um, frictions, uh, the student crises we've seen in recent years, the Indian student crisis, uh, the concerns about the safety of, uh, I think, Chinese students in Sydney more recently. All of this gets magnified <coughs> so greatly via media and social media overseas that if our governments aren't going to resource our public diplomacy to deal with, I guess, the misperceptions or the, the policy mistakes uh, that have wrapped around these crises, then I think the Australia's path into the Asian century is actually going to be a much more rocky one than many of us uh, yet realise, because I do agree with some of the comments that have been made today about the, the outdated perceptions of Australia that still persist in the region. So I, I, would, I guess to close, I would just say that um, unless we resource the country's ability to deal with the, uh, the public perceptions, the societal perceptions of Australia in Asia, even as we make these positive steps uh, as a society and through education into the Asian century, uh, we're going to have a lot of trouble along the way. Thank you very much, Rory. Um, and I think it's so important that there is an investment in our nation having a contemporary view of what's happening across countries um, um, in, in the present time rather than um, um, views that were, were formed decades ago. We've got one and two. Oh, one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Lowe from the Centre for European Studies at the ANU. Um, thank you all for this opportunity and um, it's been an interesting day of discussion. Concerns me a little bit that how quickly both within the chamber here and, 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 and certainly out in, 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 in the public domain that the discourse of Asian, um, the Asian century quickly slips into the China, you know, being Chinese century. So from the perspective of Australians of Asian descent, I can certainly, um, I thought you know, it would be important to, to, to contribute that, that, that there is as much anxiety among Asians of, you know, of Australians of Asian descent about um, this instrumentalist imperative of, of uh, considering um, Australia's Asian assets 
um, and its cultural assets and its human capital in this instrumentalist way. Um, many um, um, Asians who have come to Australia over the centuries come not just for the economics, but also for a way of life and for its political values. And that's something that really hasn't come into the discussion so far. So I would um, like to caution uh, us all to remember that, um, you know, especially in this session when we're talking about culture and, and knowledge, to, to think more carefully about this assumption and to be wary of a resinicization process that seems to be taking place implicitly. You know, Tanya reminded us of the anxieties that it can, that, that can come up. For many of us you know, uh, who, who lived through the mid-90s at a period of Hansenite politics when there was so much of this anxiety coming up, it was a period of economic struggle and that's when these anxieties came to the forefront. We may be facing that very shortly as we work through this two-way economy, two-track economy. And I think it is very important to be attendant to that. Having said that, um, it's really interesting for us to, to think, I think, about the soft power aspects of culture. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we could possibly put on the table, and AsiaLink does a terrific job of being, in some ways, the, uh, providing the cultural interface between Australia and Asia using culture, education and, and knowledge exchange. Why don't we think more, you know, and it has been put on the table for a number of, 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 um, of um, areas of uh, forming a kind of a, you know, Australian version of an Alliance Francaise or a Goethe Institute. Why don't we think about that? Um, working through DFAT possibly, but having a concentrated presence that declares Australian interest, but using soft power aspects um, in our negotiation. That's how we're going to put ourselves out in the region um, and not just be presented, as one of our speakers says here, um, as being only interested in the trade or security. You know, we need to be more than this playing these two tracks. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth Pierce, Foreign Affairs and Trade. I just wanted to say it's wonderful to have this uh, item on your agenda. Uh, we are trying to reinvent public diplomacy uh, and to engage partners, not soft power, smart power, as Hillary Clinton calls it constantly. And uh, one of the examples that I'm involved in at the moment is Ausfest, Your Excellency, the Year of India. We're going to launch that in India in October, and it's a huge exercise. I think 15 locations in India where Australian uh, education, culture, society uh, is going to be re represented, and trying to engage the young generations. And it's not just one way, it's interactive, workshops, all sorts of things. Um, we've got MasterChef going, we've got uh, some of our, our best rock bands, uh, um, etc. So this is what we're trying to do, the face of, you know, contemporary Australia in all its varieties and engaging again interactively with our Asian uh, friends and partners. Next year is the year of Vietnam and we're engaging again with the program Soft Power, Smart Power People. And partners, some of you are in the room, but again, extensive variety. And the following year is going to be the year of Indonesia. Um, and that's going to be a, a really, really big year. Lots and lots of partners and, and efforts. So there is a commitment on the part of the government, an awareness that we've got to be doing diplomacy, <coughs> diplomacy differently. And we've got to be engaging with our partners. Uh, across society, and it's got to be two-way, interactive, <coughs> reciprocal. We need more resources. That's the only thing to really make it work properly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, there was also, oh, Jocelyn. Jocelyn J from the University of Sydney. Um, I think I'm following on what all the, the just now the previous speakers have said. 
Uh, but uh, I'd like to go back to, uh, to start um, by another quote from uh, Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of Warfare. Uh, I think perhaps one that's more apt to today. Uh, and that is his very famous remark when he said, um, if, to win a, hun a hundred battles, you must start by knowing yourself and knowing the other person. And that comes really to what Alison has said, which is, you know, first of all, we have to have to work on, understand what our own image is. But then when I thought about it, I was also very struck by what Professor Yuan said. In China, there is now not just one Chinese, you can't say the Chinese say, or the Chinese are like this. As China evolves, it becomes more diverse. It is, after all, an, um, an enormous country with, and represents within it a great many people with regional variations and different ethnic variations. So in Australia too, I don't see why we should expect that there will be one Australia. We started the morning by acknowledgement of the indigenous owners of this country, and yet the indigenous population of Australia have not been mentioned at all in the discussion up till this point. We have had some mention about Asian Australians, I mean, Australians of Asian ethnic origin, and there's no reason why we should expect that those people, whether they're recent arrivals or have been here for many generations, should share exactly the same opinions or the same self-identity as uh, those who are of more Anglo ancestry and those who are of more Anglo ancestry in the urban districts will be, have different opinions and a different sense of self-identity from those who've grown up in remoter parts of Australia. So, of course, we need to undersell ourselves, but that doesn't mean we need to define one kind of essence of Australia. Just as Asia is diverse, so we also are diverse. That makes it extremely difficult for someone like my esteemed colleague in the Department of Foreign Affairs to devise a kind of smart power exercise, because how can you represent all these people? In fact, I was struck recently at a discussion at Lowy Institute with a visiting American academic who had been reviewing US exercise of cultural diplomacy or soft power and had reached this conclusion that any kind of top-down program to promote the US in, uh, the, in, the, in the world was almost bound to fail. And it would be much better if they were going to put money and resources behind something to take an existing people-based exercise and help to build that up. And so, for instance, um, they had given some support to uh, women in uh, Egypt who were establishing themselves with a, uh, a I think it was a, uh, a, a radio program. But that was building on what was already there. And so I would hope also that in devising a program for Australian engagement with Asia, we would build on what's already happening, build on the excellent work of our universities, both universities here and universities in India, in Asia, in, other, in, in China, in Japan, because those universities have had exchanges going on now for decades. That we would build on the collaboration between artists. The work in, in, in Sydney you can find probably a dozen galleries which exhibit the work of Asian artists, and there are also Asian Australian artists, places like Gallery 4A, that we would build on the work of let us say, Asian-Australian stand-up comedians. It doesn't have to be take one form, but we have to recognise that 
Our future is also the future of our young people, and it's no good us just promoting the Sydney Symphony Orchestra if, uh, if that only appeals to people with grey hair like myself. So I hope that in all our plans we will be forward-looking and build on the strengths that already exist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. I think um, the points that um, Alison had articulated, I think that you've added another point that I think is so important is to work on what is in place. And um, I'm always amazed when I visit Asia at just how many amazing um, um, relationships have been forged, but the cooperation that um, comes from those relationships and then the real programs and projects um, really do shape some of the um, incredible sectors that are growing in strength when you look at the relationship with India, with Indonesia, with Singapore, for example. And I think we can't underestimate the networks that are already in place and working so brilliantly um, in the interests of our country and also our neighbours. Are there any other comments? Um, Yes, uh, <clears throat> I'm the Ethic Korea Council, on behalf of Ethic Korea Council of New South Wales. And I also involve education and uh, for TAFE and University of Western of Sydney. And I've been involved in uh, education o over 10 years ago. And I recruit a lot of good students and create a lot of economy into Australia back in 1978. And at that time, we did create the best group of the migrants into these countries. And recently, they are not that successful. Mainly, our identity is changing. We should keep on as Australia front, as multicultural, we are uh, at the Community Council, we represent 300 to 390 something community. So if we switch to Asia century, we are nothing. We are downgrade ourselves. So what we should really should do, Australia should promote Australia. Keep on going. And we, I have attended globalization. On the first globalization was held in University of Western Sydney. We have all the professors around the world. We create a proof for globalization. And then I have been suggest, before you move to globalization, we have to develop regional area, such as Europe, Asia, uh, Middle East, whenever, or Africa. But as Asia, that doesn't mean Australia had to be Asia. Australia is Pacific. Australia is a, is a country, it's Pacific. So we don't switch to Asia. Of course, if we're using that, it's pending with Asia, other countries as well. And to compare Australia and China, Australia to India, Australia to Indonesia, we are nothing. But we are much more stronger identity as Australian. So most of the migrants come to Australia. Why they come to Australia? Because they like our old systems. They like our identity as Australia. That's why we migrate to Australia. We like our cultures. But suddenly you switch to Asia. They don't need to migrate here. It's rather they migrate into China, it's better. Or whenever countries. So I think I would suggest nowadays globalization. Our econ the world 
globalization on economy are failing because they are failure on migration. And a few years ago, we did change to ethic instead of multicultural. So ethic is acceptance for Anglo-Saxons, including as a um, race. So, and uh, the migration actually, in future, we actually try to help uh, the poorer country to education, the education over there. That's why all my program are not recruiting after 1978. We try to deliver our education, helping other countries develop their countries so we can have equal growth <coughs> and for the competition, for benefit on the globalization. Thank you. Uh, in ICT branch, AAA. Just a, a couple of, uh, or an anecdote to start with. Uh, thinking of uh, language and culture, uh, I did a lot of work up in the Philippines uh, some years ago uh, as, as part of an OSAID program. And um, you get sucked in very quickly in the Philippines because they all speak English. They speak good English. But you've got to be very careful of when they say yes. Uh, because what they, they're incredibly polite. Uh, and in fact, when they say yes to your answer, they really mean no or maybe. So there's one dimension of the language that we, we really do need to think through is how you put the cultural overlay on that and don't just accept the fact that what is said is necessarily uh, the situation itself. We need to be sensitised to those cultural issues um, in our interaction. The second one, picking up on Ruth's point and the point made by several of uh, public diplomacy, how can we get uh, much more interaction? And I wonder uh, whether or not the whole issue of visas uh, for tourism, etc., has or is being considered to try and facilitate this. The tourist industry is a very large industry and with a lot of potential. Um, uh, in terms of Australia's opportunity to bring people here and our uh, economic wealth. Um, but sometimes the whole visa issue is complex. Um, perhaps we should be looking more at that as well. The other one uh, is mentioned at the back is uh, immigration. Uh, yes, we've benefited enormously from uh, the changing profile of uh, migrants that were brought to this country and its impact uh, in so many ways in terms of the makeup now of Australia. Um, but there is one area that has often worried me a little bit. We're talking today of the need for so many qualified people in Australia and we look overseas to uh, bring in as migrants on either permanently or at least on temporary visas uh, people who have the educational skills required. But those skills in the Asian context are normally also important to the country's concern from where we're taking them. And there seems to me that there's a bit of a conflict of interest running there. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that because um, uh, how other countries would see it. Here we are uh, stealing the very people in the sense that they need. Is there a conflict of interest there? Is it seen as that or is that just part of the deal? Interesting point, and I'll just um, draw everyone's attention to the Colombo Plan, um, which was um, an amazing policy. And I think um, not only did we have um, students from Asia coming to our universities, but they returned and they really helped with the economic development of their countries, and they continue to work in a strategic way with us today. But some very interesting comments. I think we've got time probably for two more questions. One and two. Uh, just a very brief observation, and, and that is a voice from the West. My name's John Goodlad from the uh, West Australian branch of the Institute. And uh, I think we've been very careful about some of our descriptors today. 
just to take the point the gentleman up there made about Australia being an Asia-Pacific country, and the point that was made over there about an Indo-Pacific country, I think we, we have a tremendous advantage here, which is often ironically uh, identified by visiting Americans who understand the whole concept of a West Coast. And I, I would make the point that our advantage is that, and I learned it moving over there 13 years ago from, from uh, the East Coast, uh, Australia is, uh, is an Asia, it, sorry, is an is a, uh, Asia Pacific slash Indian Ocean country. And our ability to locate ourselves with the amount of work that's been done at the University of Western Australia, for instance, in the zone, is well worth recalling. There's a minor point there from the West. Richard Bronowski, I was um, struck very much, Ruth, by what you said and the optimism with which you said that there's going to be a major Australian cultural uh, effort in New Delhi and, that, and India, and that's wonderful. And also how broad it has to be, and that's great too. But I have to add that a very senior Australian representative in Delhi said to me not too uh, long ago that India, in a sense, is so preoccupied with its own rich cultures that whenever a ballet company or some other group from Europe goes there, yes, they, they're very polite, they, they watch, they listen, they absorb, but it, it doesn't really, it doesn't make much of an impact. Now, I wish you luck, and I hope that what you're doing does make an impact, and please, I'm not trying to rain on your parade, but it strikes me that I think it was Jocelyn who said, you know, bottom up is the best approach. And it does seem to me that that is something that's more important than just the big effort to have a constant uh, exchange of students and, and, and technicians and bureaucrats and, and others, especially from Australia into India. I've just talked about India now. Um, I'm going myself, thank God, after the Prime Minister's there to Delhi to set up our exchange of, uh, to set up students, uh, media students from Sydney University going to newspapers in New Delhi. We've done this around Southeast Asia, now we're going to do it in India too. That's the sort of thing that, if it continues, is going to make an impact, as much as, if not more, than the sorts of one-off things. And Ruth, let's hope that you get more money for the sorts of things you're doing and that they can be continuous, not just a one-off effort, but something that goes on. comments are very, very relevant and we've been doing this for a year. We have a, a committee based in India, New Delhi, engaging local contractors and uh, so we've, and part of the criteria is there must be interaction, permanent, workshops, etc, etc. That it's not just hopefully a one-off as you say and it's very much pitched at young people. Um, it's sort of, you know, whatever. And it does, to meet your point, we have a whole diversity of Australian culture. Gurumul is going to have uh, be at the big opening ceremony in New Delhi with uh, Rabbi Shankar's uh, daughter. Um, uh, so it's a wonderful mix. And uh, using our Indian-Australian links as well, young people, uh, universities, etc. So it's very much an investment in the future. It'll be interesting to see how it goes, and I hope successfully, Ambassador. Yeah. Um, just before I take the last question for the day, um, Ruth, um, there's a wonderful new Bollywood movie that has been put together by two um, of our alumni, one from the University of New South Wales, one from UTS. Um, a wonderful example of how students came here, absorbed what happens in Australia, um, really showed a strong appreciation for our culture and then showed the story of them returning home. So I hope that that forms part of your Ausfest. Thank you. One last question. Kyle Wilson, um, ANU. It's a comment, not a question. Um, presumably uh, the white paper will try to look at what we've got wrong, uh, but also look at what we've got right. And it, I guess I want to draw people's attention to the presence in the hall of the ambassador for Mongolia. And the Mongolian story is little known, but it's noteworthy. 
20 years ago there was a donors conference in Tokyo attended by Gareth Evans and James Baker III at which Baker said to Gareth, there's a small country in Central Asia that's trying to become a democracy and could use some help. And Gareth, with, I think, great foresight, established a modest program of uh, scholarships to Australian universities for young Mongolians. That began in 1993. It's been run by AusAid. By now, we've had about 500 of them. They come here for a year-long program. And those people, those young Mongolians, educated in Australia, tertiary educated, are disproportionately represented in the Mongolian government. For instance, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs is an ANU graduate. And I just wanted to mention it because it's little known, but it's one of those cases where we got something right. Craig, for your indulgence, Thank Chairman, to just add to that. Um, uh, my legal colleagues at Melbourne University tell me that um, uh, Mongolia has the most active human rights law um, faculties in the world. I think that's a tremendously exciting thing that's happening there. And um, uh, as the Institute is um, uh, about to produce a book on R.G. Casey, perhaps I could mention that uh, at a Commonwealth meeting at the UN in 1955, uh, Krishna Menon of it, uh, was talking about the importance of recognizing Outer Mongolia. A good point. And Casey said, what's the capital? And Krishna Menon looked very fast. People ran out of the room, came back and whispered in his ear. He said, I know the capital now. It is Udnadatta. <laughs> one. We've got time for one last question. Sorry. And this will be it. Sorry, just uh, one uh, final point uh, about uh, uh, the Asia Century white paper process, as, uh, as Alison and the ambassador's comments have made clear, every nation in the region brings its own self-conception to the plurality of uh, nations in our region. Uh, and that uh, understanding that and being clear about that is a terribly important part of thinking through uh, Australia's position in the Asian century. And so I assure you that these interests are very active interests in the process of putting together the Asian Century White Paper. And all the conceptions there are of the region, uh, that there may be of the region, uh, are obviously enfolded in that. But the core idea is the Asian Century, which clearly encompasses India and the South Asian continent. The Indo-Pacific idea is another idea that's emerged from the woodwork uh, in the last several months or so uh, around security perceptions and so on. The Asia-Pacific idea has been there for a long time. But as someone said at the beginning of today, I think it was John, uh, the focus here is on the Asian century. Uh, and the trans-Asian idea is a central idea in that process. Uh, the idea that links the whole of Asia uh, from one side to the other side uh, inextricably in a process of economic and political interactions that have to be managed in various ways. So I would conclude, uh, uh, Chair, by saying that uh, an important statement, is an important policy development uh, is the statement that the Prime Minister made uh, last September in Asia Link when she articulated the need for an Asia Century White Paper process. That's a message in itself to the Australian people and of course, it's been a message to our region in various ways about where Australia is headed. The process that followed that, uh, and the intense and wide consult consultations that have taken place, have, in have entrenched that process. But hopefully, it's only the beginning of what will be a very long uh, but uh, productive and enjoyable national conversation about Australia's role in the Asian century. Thank you very much. Um, and I think um, in bringing this session to a close, it's been fantastic to have everybody's input and stimulated from two outstanding speakers. I think the question of sustainability is so important. 
Um, and when Jocelyn was speaking, it just triggered something with me that when you look at the Colombo plan and the um, graduates that returned home, the amount of activity that has been generated from um, the students who studied in Australia have now moved into, pos into positions of influence and to now encourage, whether they're in academe or in government, steady flow now of Australian students into Asia, our own scholars into Asia, and also work um, from within Asia to provide opportunities for collaboration um, across education and other sectors. I don't think we can ever underestimate just how successful that's been. So in looking at um, the future of education, society and culture, um, as we consider in greater engagement in the Asian century, um, I think it's so important to pick up on the point that was made on my left. Let's also look at what's strong and robust and examples of successful engagement and ensure that they're interwoven into whatever the policy platforms are that come out of this very exciting, very important debate. Thank you, and can you join with me in thanking our speakers this afternoon? My name is Melissa Conley-Tyler and I'm the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. At the start of the day, the speaker, sitting in this chair, inviting us into this chamber, gave us a task. She had, we had to try to surpass the usual quality of debate in this room. Now, I will leave it to you if you think we have managed that. Um, I'm not one to make a cheap joke about the political process. I think Australia uh, should, uh, should not take its successful system of government too much for granted. But I, I would say I do think we have some advantages over the usual discussions in this room. First, we've had a very interesting topic. We're talking about something which is complex, ever-changing range of issues. It's a fast-moving topic. Uh, so it's one of those areas which makes prediction hard, but therefore very interesting. It's an important topic. I think everyone in this room would absolutely agree that Asia is key to Australia's future. And it's a timely topic. It's a topic that is in the news, and in particular, when we are reaching the final stages of the white paper process, if I might say the political pointy end of the process, as it were, this is a time where public debate is particularly valuable on some of these issues. And I think finally, we've had the great luck to have an extraordinary group of people in this room today. One of the things that's distinctive about the Australian Institute of International Affairs is that our aim is to promote understanding and interest in international issues across a whole range of groups in society. And today's been a great example of the way that the AAA works as a knowledge broker across these different groups. So we've been able to bring together experts from diplomacy, policy, business, media, academia, the interested public, um, and provide a platform for debate. And I hope what we've done is, is meet Simon Tay's request that we uh, look at the bamboo shoots, what's growing underneath, but also many different directions. So if we look over what we've heard today, we've heard Australia's future is in Asia from Gary Woodard. We've heard that, well, Asia is a contested con concept, uh, but we do think um, that uh, it, you know, in this plural region, there are things that band it together in terms of structure and substance. Thank you, Peter Drysdale. We've heard that the Asian century isn't new, Richard Rigby, but of course it's different from the Asia Pacific century, from Alison Bronowski. We've heard it's already here, and it's happening every day, from Dr. Ruan. We've heard that the Asian century is a global phenomenon. Um, if we look at the trends in technology and trade, the real independent, interdependence that that's causing, it's a, a long-term trend. Thank you, Bob Pritchard. And we've heard that this time of change has very much led to uncertainties and anxieties from Linda Jacobson and from Simon Tay. We've heard that that's something common across the region. So what messages can we take out for Australia from this discussion. Well, if I look at the economic side, with the help of Colin Chapman, we heard, I think, two very useful levels of analysis. 
So um, Ambassador Nagami uh, talked about the challenges to economic growth in China and in Japan, concerns about middle income trap. But even so, looking at the EU and the US and likely pro prognosis there, um, still growth rates high enough to reasonably characterise this as the Asian century. Peter Drysdale gave us a different level of analysis, locating this in the larger trend, the huge change in Asia's share of global output, part of that great convergence of economies which we are currently seeing. On the political and security side, we heard messages about alliance management in our relationship with the US. Uh, we heard some, I think, wonderful adjectives here. Not being monogamous, being adroit, flexible, nimble, not compliant, made me think about a whole different set of counselling that you might be given in life, but there it is. Um, we heard about building better dialogue at strategic and uh, economic level between Australia and China from, from Lindy Jacobson, she was very convincing. A lot on signalling, on constancy of language and how important that is from Rick Smith. We also heard this idea that Australia doesn't have to work out all these political and security issues all by itself from Simon Tay. Um, and that, uh, from Peter Drasdale, that working in organisations, say, like the G20, provides a big change, a big opportunity for us in taking forward. And I think the word we heard for the Asian century is the multilaterality, which is true. That's where we are. And that suggests the need for nuance in Australian policy. Thank you, Richard Rigby. And then, of course, in this final session, we've heard a lot about the vital role of education, culture and people-to-people -people contacts in order to build the range of links that matter in our relationships from Sue Boyd. And I'd like to thank you know, the wonderful contributions from everybody in the discussion and uh, Ginny Lang for moderating that. So I think I'll be taking away from today um, this idea of Asia influencing Australia as well as Australia trying to influence Asia, this inward, outward Asia, um, which I know is something that AsiaLink, for example, tracks very well. I'll also be thinking a lot about capabilities and skills as one of the real units of analysis at a number of levels, whether that's the political skills that we're going to be asking from our leaders, we're going to be asking them to walk and chew gum at the same time, walk both sides of the road, whatever it is, but also at an individual level, the skills in languages, cultural literacy, whatever that might be. And I think I, I'm very conscious that what we're talking about as an adjustment process, perhaps, is happening at a number of levels. So um, when Ken Henry spoke at the Asian Studies Association conference not too long ago, he talked about uh, national successes coming at three different levels. The level of endowment, which is your natural and, or created endowment, so that's what we can dig up from the ground, but it's also having a multicultural population. <laughs> The level which is your macro level capabilities, so you know your education system as a country, the specific policies you take. But then that last level being the micro level decisions. What do individuals do? Where do they work and study? What do individual firms do when they invest? Um, and that suggests that this isn't just about government alone. So I think when uh, Peter Drysdale talks about the palpable expectations of the white paper, I think these are really liable to be disappointed if everyone is expecting that everything in the white paper will be about what government can do. I think uh, he's quite right in saying that we have to reach out to all parts of the community to change mindset. I think Geoffrey Ewing talked about that as bringing people along. And I think Tamlin Beasley talked about how difficult that is because we're talking about a change process involving identity, fear, anxiety, nervousness. These are hard things to work through. I took uh, Les Rowe's point that we're very lucky that we are actually doing quite a lot already. Um, we're trading, we're travelling, and Australian society is, as he put it, being transformed in so many ways by Asia. Uh, and I think Jocelyn Chase suggested we build on all of those things that are already happening. But I am conscious that we're nowhere near the sort of radical change that Alison Bronowski was suggesting if we're saying, are we like Meiji Japan in a fundamental rethink? We're not there. Um, on the positive side, I really appreciated Jenny McGregor's comments uh, with the, the range of ways that there's a focus on Asia, whether that's from the national curriculum through to uh, building Asia-capable workforce in business. 
Um, and I thought the High Commissioner made some wonderful suggestions for us on how do we foster links in education and tourism. And I think Peter Drysdale is right that the white paper process in itself has stimulated a range of initiatives that we want to take forward, and that's been a very positive thing, including events like this. So I will just close with John McCarthy's fighting words. He told us this morning that if Australia is really serious about Asia, we need to put money in, whether that's foreign policy, whether that's public diplomacy, education, business. And I think if we're going to achieve the sort of aim that Alison set us of being the best informed country on Asia, admitting Asia to equality in our thoughts, we still have a way to go. And I heard Ruth saying, more resources, absolutely. Still, I think it's worth us reflecting that the white paper is still in the political process. We as a group here have our networks, have our constituencies and can take our passion for Asia into advocacy for a greater investment for the benefit of Australia in the Asian century. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zara Kimpton and I'm the National Vice President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Um, oh gosh, it's a hard act to follow um, so many of the wonderful speakers that we'd heard, we've heard today. Um, but my role is bas basically to, to thank you all. And um, I'd like to start with thanking, uh, particularly thanking the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, for its sponsorship of um, this particular forum and also for the, um, its ongoing support. Um, of all our activities, and we are particularly delighted to have with us today um, Ms. Ruth Pierce, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Public Diplomacy and Information Branch, and we were also joined by Ms. Virginia Grenville, who is the State Director of um, DFAT in New South Wales. Uh, we're also very grateful to the um, New South Wales Legislative Assembly for allowing us to have uh, this event in the Assembly Chambers. And we were very privileged to hear earlier this morning from um, the Honourable Shelley Hancock. Um, and I'm sure you'll all agree that it's been a most fitting venue uh, for the debate that's taken place today. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge um, the support that we received from Radio Australia, the Australian Network, um, and the ABC. Um, we've been very privileged to hear from so many speakers um, today who've covered um, many aspects of Australia's role in the Asian century. Um, I would particularly like to say how delighted we've been to welcome um, our overseas visitors, Ambassador Yoshiji uh, Nogami, President of the Japan Institute of International Affairs, Dr. Ron Zongji, he just told me I'd pronounced his name well. Well, he's a very diplomatic person when I was practicing it, and I'm afraid I don't think I have got it right. <laughs> Vice President of the China Institute of International Studies and Associate Professor Simon Tay, Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. The AIIA particularly values the relationship it maintains with our sister organizations, not only in Asia, but all around the world. We feel it's very important to hear from you as representatives of the region on which we focus today. I also hope that you have been able to learn more about Australia's willingness to engage with the region and that you'll be able to pass this on to your colleagues when you return home. Our economies are now linked and our own well-being now very much depends on a prosperous Asia. There are too many uh, speakers to name them all today, but we're enormously grateful um, for all speakers and chairs um, for the time that you've all spent in preparing your papers and thoughts um, prior to presenting them at this forum, and for the time that you have spent on debating today's issues. However, I would like to um, single out Professor Peter Drysdale, um, who is a member of the um, White Paper Advisory Panel, um, because it was particularly important for us to, to get an insight into some of the issues uh, which the panel has considered to be most important. Um, I'd also like to thank all the other invited participants who have contributed to the debate um, in each of the four sessions. 
and we're also particularly pleased to welcome many of our AAA fellows, um, some who've travelled from interstate. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge the support of the Australia and the Asian Century Task Force, with which we have worked closely in the past eight months, particularly in the area of public and youth outreach. Um, this has included competitions for young people, an academic roundtable, and uh, recording and broadcasting events on the Asian Century um, throughout the country. Events like today's don't happen with a lot of background work. Uh, the organising committee uh, for this National Presidents Forum has of course been led by our National President John McCarthy. In this regard and in our work at large, we are very fortunate to be led by John, who's headed our embassies and a high commission uh, in many countries of the region, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Japan and India. He has an in-depth knowledge of Asia and a large number of friends and contacts across the region. John has led an active committee which read, met regularly over the past six months. The president of AAA New South Wales, Colin Chapman, has also played a very important role and we have been, we've been fortunate to benefit from his experience as a foreign correspondent around the world. Uh, we'd particularly like to, call, to, to thank Colin and his colleagues um, at AAA New South Wales for all the work they have done for today's event and for the public forum which was held yesterday evening. Um, another very important member of our committee has been our immediate past uh, National Vice President Jeff Miller. Um, Jeff is a former ambassador to Japan and head of the Office of National Assessment and a past president of AAA in New South Wales and he's done so much for the AAA over the years. Um, our National Executive Director, Melissa Conley Tyler, has as usual worked tirelessly to bring this event to fruition. Besides the analytical skills which Melissa has just shown in her concluding remarks, she is also a highly skilled administrator. Our National uh, Deputy Director, John Robbins, has also played an important role. John works quietly behind the scenes but I am particularly aware of how hard he, is, he has worked to ensure the success of today's forum. Uh, finally, thanks to our current National Office interns, Simon Spelderwind, Ellie Fittler and Michael Thomas, who have also made an enormous contribution. The mission of the AAA is to promote public understanding and interest in international affairs. This is a vitally important um, role that, that we have. Today's focus has been on Asia, as was last year's National Presidents Forum, which was held in Perth on India, and the year before, um, the one was held on China in Brisbane. But we're an institute which is not restricted to any one region of the world. Peter Drysdale pointed out today that the rise of Asia is a global phenomenon. It's not just an Asian ph phenomenon, and I think that this is a very, very important point. Um, we've also heard so much today about the great diversity um, in Asia. Um, it's, it's made up of so many different, um, different societies and uh, so we, have to, we must remember that although we talk about Asia, it's, it's a very diverse, um, diverse region. Um, besides our speakers and participants, um, we've been also very pleased to welcome members of AAA New South Wales and um, perhaps other branches, I'm, I'm not sure whether people have come from interstate. AAA currently has about 1,400 members throughout Australia. I hope all of you who've attended and observed today's proceedings will go away with a deeper insight into how Australia can benefit from its proximity to many of the fastest growing economies of the world and how it can contribute to the development and prosperity of, a, of these Asian nations. As Dick Wilcott said today, our history is our past, but our geography is our future. But then Jeff Miller also made a, an, another very interesting, uh, added another dimension when he said, of course, um, technology could well override the geography. And I think that that also gives us something else to think of as we move forward. We now await with great interest the release of the government's white paper. Um, in the meantime, We've certainly all been left with plenty to think about following today's discussion. Um, proceedings have been recorded and will be available um, on APAC 
and the AAAA's um, YouTube channel, AAAA Vision. Um, so I encourage you to um, talk to your friends and colleagues about this and recommend that um, if they're interested that they should look at these methods of finding out more about what transpired today. So uh, to conclude, um, on behalf of our President John McCarthy and all of us at AAAA, I would like to thank you so much uh, all for coming and for um, the great contributions that you've made. Thank you.